Ready. Play. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time it is in the world, wherever you are tuning in from. It is now the 12th of December, at least it is here uh, in Europe where we are all based. Um, and we're here to talk about the ATP year. Damien said, uh, what does that mean? And I said, January to December and uh, all that happened in between, basically. Um, obviously, with a particular focus, you may have seen the pictures and the images and the, and the description. But of course, Nadal sort of pretty much dominated the first few weeks of, of the year, I would say, until probably the Indian Wells final. And I would then say he handed over the baton uh, for various reasons to Carlos Alcaraz uh, before briefly regaining it in, in June when he won the French Open. Then, of course, we had Wimbledon where Djokovic uh, reminded everybody just how good he is there. Um, then, of course, we had the build-up to the US Open. And, and for me, uh, I was a little bit surprised about Alcaraz returning to form at that point, but we'll... We'll come to that. And then the final stage of the season was once again, really, the Djokovic show uh, with an honourable mention for Holger Runa. Well, I've just done the ATP year in a minute and a half. I guess we can all go home, Jethro. <laughs> yeah, see you later, guys. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> uh, so far, we've had zero viewers as well. So it'll be uh, be interesting uh, <laughs> if, if it went beyond beyond zero anyway. Listen, that would be quite a good uh, video, actually, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I just did it in a minute and a half, and we've got we've got a viewer on board now, so make sure you hit that that like button. Um, yeah, I did it in a minute and a half, but of course, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, Damien, what were your thoughts end of December, beginning of January? What was going through our minds when it came to the ATP tour? I guess for the past I don't know five years, ten years, we've all been waiting for the moment when the next gen takes over. Has that happened? sort of uh probably not much more than you know in 2021 or something still we had Djokovic and Nadal taking free slams so in that sense I think our expectations weren't really met uh I I believe most of us uh you know thought that this was going to be a, a bit more of a generational change and uh you know something something more exciting more uh, newcomers more Grand Slam champions you know first time first time winners will will happen uh it didn't but you know still it was of course hugely enjoyable and and we did get carlos alcaraz and we do get him as a as a year-end number one although you know that has some asterisk to it but still he is the the year-end number one and it's not like he didn't deserve it can can anyone here remind me if when was the last time we had a non-big three year-end number one Andy Roddick. Must be Andy Roddick, yeah. Must be Andy Roddick, I think. Yeah. 2002. 2003. Three. 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 Yeah. So let's... Yeah. Yeah, the best best part of 20 years anyway. Oh, um, you said non-big so that's, non, that's non three, right? You said non-big three, then yeah, Mari. Yeah, non-big three, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then Mari. Oh, yeah, Mari. right. Yeah, Andy Mari. Yep, sorry, sorry, Andy. Uh, oh, dearie me. Terrible We've got a few Andy job. Mari fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, I've already, I've already, I'm already covered myself in shame yesterday in the in the quiz I had with uh, Jack's podcast, and I'm not doing myself any favor. But anyway, <laughs> the big four aside, the big four aside, um, uh, we have had a we've we, we've taken a step, but I still think, uh, as you said, uh, Damien, we've got a long way to go before we can quite dismiss. The big three. Of course, we did have one member of the big three retire, but we'll we'll get to that when we get to September, I suppose. Um, my thoughts going into the year, and then I'll hear what you had to say, uh, Mario. Was really it was dominated for me by two of the three big members. It was all about Nadal. What kind of Nadal was going to turn up in Australia? Of course, he contracted COVID as well uh, before announcing to the world Shh, that I think there was a tweet saying, Shh, "I'm here." Um, but the other big issue, of course, from I would say from the beginning of December, it started to become more and more in our thoughts. What is Novak Djokovic's vaccine status? And this was gathering pace and gathering pace and gathering pace until really we got the answer. 
on about the 2nd or 3rd of January with the tweet from Novak, which was, look at me, here I am, at a very, very cold airport, I believe, in Belgrade. Um, and he was en route to Australia. What were your thoughts at that point, Mario? Uh, it, it's been... It's been obviously a, a weird situation because we were not used to to talking about this kind of things, and and probably um, our opinion has also a little bit changed through um, as the time has passed uh, throughout the year because conditions have changed throughout the world, uh, rules uh, have changed. Um, but yeah, probably in January, uh, it was difficult to, to, to pronounce, to give a, a clear opinion because, uh, we were discovering things as, uh, as the days, um, yeah, there was, there was the trial, uh, there was the, uh, even the the unclear situation at the airport, we did, we didn't know if they um, effectively uh, allowed him to enter or not. Um, yeah, so I uh, I really don't know what to say because it was um, uh, like I was like one day I had an opinion, one day my opinion. Um, <laughs> It changed because uh, uh, we we discovered some new new details. Um, so I I only can say that I'm glad that probably this whole thing uh, is over now. And, but yeah, he, he, there was a lot of talking uh, obviously about that situation. Uh, I don't know. It's been it's been quite sad. Um, Probably a, a defeat for everyone in that case. I think that's fair enough, Mario. Jethro, have you got any final thoughts on this before we get to the tennis? Yeah, no, I just it was, it was crazy. It just you know dominated all sporting headlines. You know, apart from like the Ashes, you know, cricket at the start of the year. It was it was crazy. Um, and it just yeah, I just think yeah, everyone came out looking pretty bad. Um, you know, especially. Uh, you know Craig Tiley and you know the Australian government for sure. Um, anyway, it was a real shame. It just put a massive dampener on the start of the year. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure Netflix were absolutely thrilled because you know now they've got an absolutely incredible first two episodes to to start their show that will come out this year. But yeah, it yeah. was um, it was a real shame. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, but as you say, I think I think nobody came out of it uh, looking good um, uh, indeed. But fortunately, this year that won't be uh, dominating the headlines, or at least it doesn't appear to be. So um, let's get to the tennis because we did have a few tournaments. I remember uh, people looking at these tournaments, including myself, thinking, oh, that may give us an indication as to how things are going to go. I know Kokinakis won an early tournament at 250. Uh, anybody else win tournaments at that uh, before? Before I mean, I know Rafa Nadal won his 250. Was there anybody else that really was making you think, oh, maybe they'll have a good run in Australia? Uh, Monfils, I have to say. Uh, okay. He won the title, the two, 250 title, and then he uh, he reached, the, um, I think, the quarterfinals in yeah. Melbourne. So he had uh, he had a good run. Uh, he ended up only losing uh, the deciding set against Berrettini. So uh, it was a very, very good January for, for him. Yeah, what was the 251, do you know? He won uh, in Adelaide. Adelaide, Adelaide. Adelaide there Adelaide. were two, two events. Uh, Australia. Australia. <laughs> Something yeah, in Australia. Australia. I, I, I never I, can, I, you I know. Just... Be, I think he beat Hatchinoff maybe in the final. Mm. Yeah, there I'm was something like out. that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, yeah. there was something like that. Yeah, Kokinakis, it was the classic case of, you know, s s succeeding in, a, in just the week before the slam starts and then you have nothing left for the slam. But of course... Yeah, because he, uh, he went out first round, Damien. I remember him Yeah, being lost to Hanfman. 6-2, 6-2, 6-2 or something like that. And, uh, yeah. Which was pre yeah. a pretty crazy score, but yeah, he was just totally physically dead. Of course, he ended up winning yeah. the doubles, but 
Uh, but yeah, that, that's a pretty different thing. Of course, doubles starts a, a bit later too. And we were all hungry for that Kokinakis Nadal uh, round two matchup, yeah. and we didn't get it. Jethro, what were your thoughts yeah. going into the Australian Open? I mean, obviously, once we knew that Djokovic was not going to be in the draw, were you looking like I was at a potential quarterfinal between Zverev and uh, and Nadal and thinking that's where I had Nadal going out? I, I think Zverev had yeah. won the ATP Tour Finals in the November. And Anyway, tell mm -hmm. me, Jethro. Yeah, I obviously saw the draw come out, and I remember I wrote an article actually, I think on the Saturday or Sunday before, and I thought it was probably one of his toughest draws yet. And then it did, you know, obviously Shapovalov, you know, took down Zverev pretty easily, and it really kind of opened up for Nadal a bit. Uh, I thought Zverev was going to be really tough. I thought, yeah, quarterfinals or semifinals. I thought there was a lot of interesting stuff from the ATP Cup for me. That okay. obviously the Canadians with Felix and Shapovalov, I thought. They were both going to have big tournaments, and they did. To be fair, I think you know Felix had match points against Medvedev, and he had to, you know, properly serve his way out of trouble to to save those. Shapovalov gave Nadal a big scare and could have won it in five. Yeah. Um, thought thought Schwartzman was kind of looking good on the quick courts. You know, he got that win over Sitsa Pass on courts that you know Sitsa Pass would always beat him on. You'd think, and yeah, and then he went out very disappointingly to. Uh, Chris O'Connell in the second round but um yeah I didn't I kind of just thought Medvedev was the overall quite clear favorite even though you know you hear all these stats like oh no one's ever won you know back-to-back -back slams after winning their first slam and all of this and then you know I wasn't really thinking no, about no that. one had I just ever, thought no one had ever won 21 slams either so there's lots of mm, there was always going to be yeah something. exactly <laughs> yeah um so I saw that happening um and he was he was very close very close to accomplishing that so yeah, yeah. um so i uh, listen i think we've got there's there'll be a lot of comments about the final itself but um before we get I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the medvedev match as well uh against felix felix going on to have a a reasonably good year i would say um but that was probably the second best match of the tournament i guess he did have match points but before we get to that damien i've got up on the screen this is the fourth round clash between um, uh, between Zverev and Shapovalov, and then we'll probably go into a bit of a deeper dive with the quarterfinals. I I've got this. It's a classic image, of course, of Zverev losing his temper. Do you remember this match? Did you watch it against Shapo? Were you surprised by the result and how things panned out? Yeah, I mean, Zverev had all these issues in best of five play, which by the time we hit Ron Garros, it seemed like he sort of you know managed to get the hold of that. Uh, of course, what happened? <laughs> what happened in Paris happened. To quote Rafa Nadal, uh, almost quote, maybe paraphrase. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Shapoval Zverev. I thought this was just one of uh, these uh, Zverev performances where the forehand doesn't hold up at all. It was super loopy. He was just afraid to hit through it. And yeah, very disappointing performance because it seemed like, as you said, he was uh, he had a lot of momentum coming into 2022. It seemed like this could finally be his chance at maybe not winning a slam, but, you know, getting far again uh, after, of course, he had one final in 2020. Uh, yeah, and he didn't do that. Uh, of course, he only got to play two slams, but, you know, this was the disappointing one. Uh, I guess Paris was disappointing for another reason, but, you know, we're going to talk about it later. But, uh, but yeah, just, just a ridiculously awful performance from him, honestly. Uh, did not see that coming, coming, you know, into that much because, well... Uh, even if you, even if we thought that maybe Shapovalov has a chance, we probably didn't think that was going to be so, you know, such a tame uh, performance from Zverev, and and that was really all that happened in that fourth round there. And I definitely remember watching it. Yeah, Australia was a was a time where I just, uh, you know, January 2022, I just lived on a completely different time zone for a moment. <laughs> Not that I was, you know. Uh, technically living in a different time zone. I just functioned on a different one. And then, so yeah, <laughs> I remember watching this one in like the I don't know, 7 a.m. or whatever it was. Yeah, right. But I I, um, I certainly think uh, many of us on this uh, channel today were, were living in a different time zone. Uh, listen, um, what are your thoughts on the Medvedev Felix match, Mario? It's been a, a very good match. Also, um... Probably not Felix's fault about the the comeback, 
uh, Med would have made that day because uh, I remember him serving very, very well in crucial points. Um, even uh, uh, when uh, Ojeda Yassim had a, a match point in that clash. Um, but uh, it's been like one of that uh, one of those matches uh, um, in which you learn a lot uh, because Felix lost that one, uh, but uh, giving a good impression despite having been like two sets uh, to love up and then losing. Um, and I think that he he's used that match even. Uh, 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 probably uh, we also made a comparison between this match and the semi-finals he lost against Medvedev uh, at the US Open in 2021. Two very different matches and uh, Ojer Aliasim mm, seemed more more competitive um, against the same player. Um, quite same condition. No, they're different, but yeah, you know... Mm, quite similar in some way. Uh, so, um, doing a comparison, uh, Felix uh, uh, went out uh, um, on a high on a high tone for me uh, on that tournament, even if it's a loss that, that hurts because, yeah, two sets to love, but um, analyzing it um, in, like, after 12 months, um, I think that uh, it's been a, a very, very good match for his um, his path, his path, his path of growing, uh, growing towards um, more heights during this this year. Sure. Um, any thoughts on the Monfils Berrettini match? I mean, it was it was closer than I thought. I thought Berrettini would win this comfortably, but it ended up being five sets. Anyone watch this match? Put your hand in the air. You watched, I watched it, did you? Uh, probably, but. <laughs> I watched on, a bit in the morning, but I had to go to work, so I missed the like the third set and on sadly. Go on, Mario. Go on, take it. I I remember that match very very well, uh, because yeah, uh, Berrettini was was playing very very good uh, at the beginning, uh, but then uh, the momentum uh, shifted a lot uh, because Berrettini seemed um, seemed seemed bad physically uh, like at uh, during the fourth set so uh, the momentum uh, changed in a big way uh, going into the fifth set um, i was um, almost sure that monfields would have uh, would have kept up uh, and would have won that match uh, because berettini um, seems struggling a lot and the crowd was chanting for Monfields, and uh, but Berrettini had an incredible um, strength to stay there, to stay there, and to uh, he um, he also had an argument with the crowd, uh, and he took energy from that to okay. um, yeah to to win in the end easily. Uh, the fifth set, so it was a very, very good, good performance for him. Not only because he played good in at the beginning, but uh, also because uh, he he was able to um, to change the things in the end where uh, where we we would have thought that Monfils would have won that one. For me, uh, the sinner Sitsi Pass match was also a little bit of a surprise in that I'd seen City Pass, like Jethro mentioned, lose to Schwartzman uh, in the ATP Cup, uh, the now no longer existing RIP ATP Cup. Um, and I had also was also aware of his injury issues and the way he'd changed his racket. And City Pass, for me, didn't seem to be in the right place uh, at that point to to probably beat Yannick Sinner. I actually I can't remember if I predicted Sinner to win, but I certainly thought it would be close, and I was completely wrong on every level. For me, this was Sinner's best performance of the year. Uh, put your hand in the air if you saw it. Sinner's best performance of the year? Sorry, did I, I, City Pass, City Pass. City, City Pass. Passes. Ah, yeah, it's very possible, yeah. yeah. It was pretty yeah. amazing, yeah. Did, did, you, did anyone watch this? Because if not, I can yeah, just yeah, take yeah. Go on, Jeff. Go on, can, David. You can, no, you can, you can go. I mean, I... I, I mean, just, 
I, mean, I will it, be lying to you if I remember much about it. I mean, I, I definitely mm-hmm. remember putting out a, a tweet after this match about how insane Tsitsipas was. I think it was like yeah. about dominating uh, the zero shot, zero four shot rallies uh, in that matchup or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, after 12 months or 11 more, more like, uh, <laughs> it's pretty hard to remember, but there, it definitely was one of one of Tsitsipas's better showings this year. And And yeah, I think even... Even if in the past uh, I have been a little maybe, um, you know, I, I didn't really think of uh, Sinner's potential as highly as some other, you know, tennis, let's say, uh, even guys on this channel. Uh, I also thought that this was going to be a close match and it definitely wasn't. I even managed to to find that tweet weekly and I think, yeah. There was just, uh, it looks like the Tsitsipas was just hitting forehands after every single first serve, almost 92%. I'm not sure which stage of the match this is. Uh, yeah, 4 1 in the third. Uh, so, you know, pretty, pretty insane. And looks like there was just that not much pressure on, on Tsitsipas's weaker wing. And yeah, he was just able to completely dominate the short rallies behind this serve. And, uh, and that's really it. And yeah, pretty disappointing performance. But if we look at Sinner's 2022 as a whole, there was a lot of quarterfinal losses like that. Of course, the, the US Open is the first one that comes to mind, or, or even Wimbledon. And these were pretty competitive, although Wimbledon not so much, even though it was a five-setter. But yeah, Sinner in general has a lot of losses like that to, uh, let's say, the, the top opposition. But yeah, I, I think yeah, we all I, I was just before more... this one that... Mm-hmm. I was just more thinking that, to be honest with you, I thought Sitz Pass was unbelievable that day. I thought, um, I thought that Sin it wouldn't really it didn't really tell us much about Sinner, but it, I thought it was telling us a lot about Sitz Pass and the year that he may well be having. Because I thought, okay, Sitz Pass is back on track. Um, but I said it's his best performance of the year. Um, but there's not a lot of competition for that award. So um, there we go, Stefano mm. Sitz Pass. Your best performance of the year came in January. Uh, listen, That's Monte very Carlo. Harsh. I'm sorry. When did he play better? Maybe against Djokovic in, in Paris Percy, but he didn't win. Oh, so, I would have to like, have think about won. it deeply. I will I will mention one thing though, because I, I just checked the stat on uh, Sinner's quarterfinals this year, and he actually has a 2 8 uh, win loss record in them. And do you guys yeah. remember whom he beat in these two quarterfinals? Because it's quite shocking, actually. Sinner? No, but it will be in a. You mean. Yeah. Sinner, Vukic yeah. and so Carboyas he... Baena. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Listen, there is a quarterfinal that we haven't mentioned. I remember living and breathing every single moment of this match. I know Gene, who's also in the chat. Hi to you, Gene, by the way. Um, I know that uh, that he was certainly paying attention to it too because I remember speaking to him about it shortly afterwards. Uh, I, I, put your hand in the air if you saw it, and then I'll I'll come to you after I've yeah. given my thoughts on it it might i might be the only one who saw it from mm. start to finish i i saw it. anyone else see it damien yeah, yeah not not the whole match no, i saw a bit and then it was like 3 a.m here so i had to sleep so i think it was I think quite it kind of it's kind of running theme a. with a lot of these matches yeah so yeah was, yeah 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 this is a moment, by the way, where, where Shapovalov was annoyed with Rafa. I think it was towards the end of the first set, although it could have been in the second. It was certainly when he was losing anyway. Um, and and listen, I, I'll come to you, Damien, in a second on, on this match. Uh, I can see that uh, Gene is getting some comments in about tactical awareness, uh, about Medvedev, I think, actually. But listen, uh, regarding this match anyway... Um, in some ways, I think Shapovalov lost it because I think in the fifth set, Nadal was there for the taking. Nadal, if we remember, was struggling physically. He was playing really well. I think there was a lot of talk about Nadal's return position. He was mixing it up uh, in the previous rounds, and and he was suddenly uh, he found a good spot. Let's say for the first two sets, but then Shapovalov started to play well, and Rafa was struggling physically. Uh, we we remember the images of him getting water, hot or cold air because he was just really struggling, and in the fifth set. Nadal was basically, he got an early break and um, and just held on. And held on because he was serving well. I thought throughout Australia, I think Rafa served pretty well. Um, and I think he relied on that from two love up. But he did have a helping hand from Chapeau. Damien, give me your thoughts. Yeah, this was a bit of a pattern in, in Nadal's matches there, like along with the one against Berrettini, along with the one against Kachanov, where yeah. in the middle of them, they he would just, you know, fall down physically a bit, uh, fade away. 
Um, there was also that concern about his food coming from 2021 as well. And as it turns out, of course, it would remain an issue throughout uh, the next next year. And, you know, he even said that it's like a chronic injury. It's not something yeah. that really comes and goes. It's something he has to play with all the time. Uh, so, yeah, there was a lot of physical concerns. I, I remember Shapovalov just really uh, stepping forward into the court in, the, in sets three and four, turning the, you know, the aggression to an even um higher level and yeah and then he just didn't uh, do that in the in, in set five yeah this was one of one of the moments where it really felt like like nadal was yeah as you said there for the taking maybe not so much against berrettini maybe not so much against kachanov uh in these other matches where he had physical uh you know issues but uh but this was one where it really felt like it could be shapovalov's breakthrough event of course berrettini was either waiting in the semifinals or uh, or you know, soon to be waiting for him in the semifinals. Can't remember you know the, the exact schedule of these of these quarterfinals, but uh, it, it certainly felt like one of these moments. When maybe if Shapovalov takes this one, it's gonna be like a huge thing for him, right? After after, of course, just one semi before uh, at a slam, and and yeah, I just don't think he stepped up in the fifth. And this was this was probably Nadal at, it, at his most vulnerable this that, that event. Uh, probably coupled with the zero forty um, in in the final, of course the the, the famous one, but uh, yeah. but that was another deal. Any more f- thoughts on this match before we move on to the semis? Anyone? Yeah, I remember that Shapo lost a little bit the plot uh, after, uh, like, an, in the end of the fourth set and uh, the beginning of the fifth. There, there was. Uh, an argument. Uh, uh, he was a little bit polemic with the with the chair with the chair umpire. Um, probably, yeah. There there was a reason, but probably not in the way he uh, he made it. So I I think that probably uh, another player with an, with another temper a bit a bit of less temper than Shapovalov would have said nothing um, yeah but I remember because it was a little bit uh, a little bit curious and probably unexpected um, but but yes it, it opens uh, it opens a lot of talking probably not the uh, not today the the right moment to uh, to talk about the that that argument, um, so yeah. But I remember that Shapovalov lost a little bit the plot. In fact, at the beginning of the fifth, I remember the the early break, uh, as we we have said, uh, and that may made a huge a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, the final thing I'll say on this match is that on match point. Um, uh, there's a bizarre moment where uh, Shapovalov uh, smashes his racket. I always think it's a bit of a uncomfortable moment when the person who loses on match point is smashing his racket. Rafa does kind of give him a quick glance because he's actually, I think the ball goes out and it's, it just sums up his fifth set, Shapo, because he puts it into the tram line when really he should be at least keeping the ball in play, if not winning the point. And it goes in the tram line. Uh, he smashes his racket. Rafa is celebrating, just staring right at his box because he's sort of heading towards the tram line, which is right where his box is. He says he does have a quick look because he realizes that he's heard a racket smash uh, and gets back with celebrating his birth in the semifinals where he would play uh, Matteo Berrettini. He had a three-day break because he was playing basically first from that moment onwards. So therefore, he was playing the Tuesday semifinal, semifinal uh, sorry, Tuesday uh, quarterfinal, which meant he had a three-day break until his Friday semifinal. The roof was closed. Um, what were your thoughts, Jethro, going into the semifinal against Berrettini? Did you see it as being Nadal's favourite by that point, or, or what were your thoughts? Yeah. Um, look, I really rate Berrettini. I think he's amazing at Grand Slam level, especially probably one of the best in the world at, you know, at the five set, five set level, but there was just too much that Nadal could exploit. Um, start of the year, ATP cup and throughout the Australian open, I thought the Berrettini's backhand's definitely getting better and better. It's, you know, it's, it's getting there, but there will come a point when Nadal will still exploit it. Um, and you know, he just, he, he did just that, um, you know, Nadal can just 
pin him in on his, on his backhand. Or players can go hard into Berrettini's forehand because he hasn't got a particularly good defensive forehand, and then they can just smack it into the backhand wing and he can't defend very well off that wing either. So, yeah, it was an uns... But, you know, he can also peak really well for a set. So that was a very unsurprising result, I think. Yep. Damien, any, any thoughts on this match before we move over to the other semi-final? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a mo- uh, there was a match at the ATP Cup where everyone was like, uh, "This is probably the best Ber- Bertin's backhand has looked." I cannot okay. remember what. I think it was Medvedev. Was. I think it was against Medvedev. I think could have been the one that he lost, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 was it. I I I'm pretty sure you're right uh, because mm-hmm. I remember him losing that match uh, that I'm talking about. Yeah, there, there was this one performance where everyone thought that it was getting so much better. Um, I actually thought that Bertini should have a chance, mostly as Nadal was kind of struggling and, of course, never really... Well, maybe it's, it, it's a bit of a stretch to say that he was never really that good at the Australian Open, but, you know, at least compared to, to the US Open or, or of course, to, to, to Clay. Uh, but, yeah, as Jeffrey said, I think, the, the, you know, the leftiness against the one-handed... Uh, the, not the one-handed backhand, but the terrible backhand of, uh, of Bertini uh, <laughs> is pretty much... Uh, uh, a pattern that kills this rivalry a lot of the time, and that was one of these cases. But I still expected more from Berrettini, and and that was of course uh, combined with uh, yeah what we said about the Medvedev match at, at the DATP Cup, where it seemed like it was really taking a, a turn uh, for the for the good. Uh, of course, maybe Berrettini couldn't really improve it further in 2022 due to injuries. Uh, but also, like, look, just looking back at it, back at it right now, we we also had this one, uh, the, the five setter between Alcaraz and Bertini in the third round. And mm-hmm. yes, honestly, e- even though he, yeah, even though he lost it, uh, Alcaraz, I think he was just very comfortably outplaying Bertini from the baseline. And maybe that should have been a bit more of a hint that, you know. Uh, it's going to be hard for Matteo to uh, to stick with Nadal in the semis. But I do agree, of course, that in best of five play over the past couple of years, he's shown incredible consistency, pretty much uh, unmatched by anyone else on the tour, but Djokovic and Nadal probably. Yep, that's fair enough. Uh, listen, let's move over to the other semi-final. Um, Mario, giving a good, a good nod there. He's quite pleased to talk about the other semi-final. <laughs> Tell me your thoughts on the City Pass match. Of course, we had the the controversy with City Pass and 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 Daniel Medvedev getting upset. What did he say? He said, "I, I remember his thought process with the umpire. He was really frustrated. He said, you are a you are a, <laughs> a, a small cat.'" A small cat, yeah. <laughs> Which at the moment we we. We were like, "What's this? <laughs> what, what does it mean?" And then, and then we we understood because he he like he ex- explained this. Um, yeah, but uh, I was not surprised about the result uh, because um, at, at that moment, given um, given where Medvedev and Tsitsipas were in January, and given their like they had to add history. At the moment, I, I I was like zero zero surprise for me um, that Medvedev won it in four sets. Um, Tsitsipas played quite well, I have to say. Um, yeah, not like in the, not like in the quarterfinals, but he played a quite good match. But Medvedev was too good at the moment. Um, probably uh, given what uh, what we we were uh, we were seeing in those semifinals, probably Medvedev, uh, uh, yeah, in that day looked like the favorite to win the title, and then we we know what happened. Um, it was enjoyable, I have to say. Uh, Medvedev played played a good match, and so nothing nothing more to say, I think. Yeah, uh, he did play a really good match, and it just looked like, um, despite Nadal, you know, pulling off miracles perhaps against Chapo and to some extent Berrettini, um, it looked like Medvedev was going to win this. Right? Is that, did everyone think? Did anyone think Rafa was the favorite going into the final? Yeah. I thought he was going to lose zero and three. And uh, honestly, I don't even think I was wrong. Right? I mean, sometimes. You know, when a tennis player effectively hey, Damien, wins... I think you, Damien, you were wrong. You were wrong. I, I don't <laughs> think so. No, I, I, I mean, I, I seriously believe that, you know, when something like this happens, or I don't know, 
uh, Feather blowing too much points at Wimbledon 2019. Were you really wrong if you thought that Feather was going to win that? If you did, did you really, I uh, know, were I you really see, wrong yeah. if you thought that yeah. Medvedev was going to win three and zero in the Australian Open final? I mean, he effectively think... won it three and zero, but he just, you know, didn't deliver on the mental uh, side of things. And that's when it, you know, it developed into a completely different match. Uh, in general, the final, I'm sorry if I'm sort of skipping, uh, but that final uh, had uh, like two or three different matches in it, in, in it um, to me. And yeah, I, I, I don't even think I was wrong. It, it was pretty clear that Medvedev was the stronger tennis player. He just, yeah, when, when it mattered most, it, it, didn't, it didn't end up mattering that he was the stronger tennis player on the day even. Uh, but yeah, that was for all the other reasons rather than actually, you know, who had the stronger level coming into the final. Listen, I think the, the, the Wimbledon example you gave, you know, is let's say you predicted Federer would win that. He didn't win it. I don't think we can go, ah, oh, you said Federer would win because as you say, he, he basically yeah. did everything to put himself in a position to win it. I think though, when you say that, 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 Medvedev was going to win comfortably 3-0 and or, 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 or basically in straight sets and, and barely dropping any games, and it ends up being five sets and the other guy wins, then I think your argument becomes weaker. I don't know. If if, if he's up two sets and then, uh, what was it, 2-2 two, two and uh, three break points in the third or 2-3 and three yep. break points? 2-3. And 2-2 two, um, two, two. Two, two or 2-3, I can't remember. But two, uh, if he goes yeah. up like that and especially thinking of how much he was dominating up until that point, I think maybe mm-hmm. there were some some mm-hmm. there were some tougher moments in the second set, if I remember correctly. But like in general, yeah. if you that maybe even some set points saved. But if you just looked at the first I don't know, two hours and a half, it was a, such a stark difference between uh, between uh, Method F and Nadal. So yeah, I don't think I was wrong there. I'm calling myself right on that occasion. <laughs> but I See, uh, you know I'm if doing... someone predicted Nadal to win, I'm also calling them right. I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm just saying I wasn't wrong. <laughs> I'm calling myself wrong on 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 a double level because okay. I thought Medvedev would win and I thought there's only one way Rafa wins this and it's in straight it's or four sets. Okay. So I I basically had it wrong twice if you like. I couldn't have been more wrong. Jethro, um did you think the same as me that if Rafa's going to win this he had to do it in straight sets? Um, I didn't really have, you know, kind of a criteria of how Rafa could win. I just, I mean, I just went in with an open mind. He was having dips. He was having dips in the tournament. And it was always sort of third set onwards, fourth set. He got through against Shapo, but like I say, it was Shapo's fault. Yeah, I think, I mean, I really had Medvedev as the favourite. I just thought there's just, I just can't see Rafa doing it. But then I was like, if there's ever a match he's wanted to win more in his life, it's probably this because... This now, this probably is his last chance to win the Australian Open for a second time. And I know I said that in 2017 when he lost <laughs> yeah. to Federer, I said it in 2019 yeah. when he lost to Djokovic. And after that, I was like, okay, he actually probably won't win it again. And here he is in another final. I was like, okay, this is his last chance. Um, and maybe that was what he was thinking at you know, love 40, 2 3. Um, yeah, it was just extraordinary. But I definitely didn't see Rafa winning. But after he won the third set, I thought, okay, we could be on something here. Um, yeah, it was it was bonkers. Looking back on this match, Mario, because I don't think we, we have time for all the tactics and what happened. Looking back now, we know what happened. Was it match of the year or, or not? I think I know what you're going to say, Mario. No, probably uh, we have to say that it was a Grand Slam final. So... When we when we say the match of the year, we we have also to consider at which stage the match uh, has been played. So probably considering all the things, um, yeah, uh, it was the match of the year. I also remember, um, for example, that even in the fifth set, uh, we had like some uh, some shift of momentum because I remember Rafa served for it at 5-4 and Medvedev broke back and it was kind of surprising for me because um I lost uh I lost like my beliefs in Medvedev at that point uh, and Medvedev was really good to to broke back to uh, to brought himself to five ball 
and then Nadal okay still still won it seven five but um yeah it's it's been an incredible match i remember being uh like more than five hours um concentrate on the television and stay there because till the end i i was like yeah uh, probably meta is gonna win it but and then rafa comes back and then the opposite so yeah it's been a fantastic match you have to say I think it's not even close to much of the year, honestly. Like, the drama was there, of course, the five hours Grand Slam final, sure, but they never peaked at the same time. Uh, half of, like, the fourth set was Medvedev not moving his legs. Then he started, I, I think he started moving spot, ser- started spot serving better in, 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 in the, the fifth set, which is how he sort of got, got, uh, got himself, you know, at least to a, to a respectable scoreline there. Of course, as you, as you said, he broke back. Uh, where, where you kind of thought that maybe he still has some chances, but then again, he, he could see that physically he's just not there anymore. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, as we said, we all thought that Nadal was going to be the one struggling, but was Medvedev perhaps due to the you know mental toll that uh, choking that that first set uh, took uh, took on him. Uh, but yeah, to me, it's just not of uh, you know the quality wasn't high enough. If a match has like a set and a half where one player is barely moving, then it's gonna be very hard for me to qualify it as the match of the year. I would put it as match of the year because I think there's various criteria. I think you're you're being a bit harsh as well, Damien, on on Rafa. I thought his level was for most of the second set, for most of the third set, for various periods of the fourth and and fifth. I thought his level was very high. I know what you mean. I do know what you mean Mm -hmm. in terms of both producing their best tennis in an Alcaraz-Sinner sort of way, because that's the obvious uh, competitor, at least at at slams. Um, But that's a quarterfinal. There was something as well about this match that although, um, you know, Medvedev, the first four games was, was nuts. The first four games was Medvedev looking like he's going to win this easily and Nadal was struggling to hold serve and having to pull off worldies, but he was pulling them off and it was in, it was insane for so many reasons. Then Medvedev like just steamrolls him for the next four games as he was threatening to do. And then, but then the second set provided a lot of drama too with, with Rafa playing well, with serving for it, but not managing. And he had an overhead as well that he's put into the net, bringing back memories of the year before. He was also up a mini break in the tie break. Um, and the fact that he lost that, uh, and it was a really jarring loss. But from that moment onwards, you never really knew what was going on. There was so much chaos. And uh, by the way, a lot of the chaos was going on in Daniel Medvedev's head. I, I will agree with that, particularly him being strewn in the middle of the court. But listen, um, Nadal did win it. Um, Jethro, you can you can call you can call this match of the year or not? Oh. Oh, I don't know. I think I think in some ways yes, in other ways no. Like I agree with some of what Damien said. To be fair, I think if I'm looking at match of the year, I would like dr- dramatics and situation and you know what ha- you know the kind of events are one thing, but the quality of the tennis also needs to be a very big part of it. You know, people called. Federer Djokovic 2019 match of the year. You know, so many people didn't. That certainly was, wasn't match of the year in terms of quality of tennis. Um, that they like Alcaraz Sinner probably. I'd probably put both of them for different reasons, to be honest. But I think yeah. in ten years, the 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 people will be surprised we've been having this conversation. But but that's another yeah. debate. But they won't another... re- they won't remember that much, right? I mean. No, exactly. I mean, they, they, if they, you're they looking at it, it ten years, you're not gonna, you know, you're not be, gonna remember how the fourth set, like the middle of the fourth set, looked. That that's something completely yeah. different, right? Uh, just yeah, like I mean, you know, no. I just, I just think mm-hmm. there's various points on it, and and listen, listen, we could go on about this, and I think everyone's made good points. I agree with you all. Jethro, there, sitting on the fence, by the way, he's got splinters. Um, listen, Always. but let's move on. Always. We spent 44 minutes on Australia, and, and I'd like to keep this under two hours if we can. So, listen, Rafa ends up sort of actually playing even better for me in Acapulco, uh, beating Medvedev easily. We'll come into, we'll come on to Medvedev a bit later in terms of his year, because I thought about dwelling on it right now, but let's not. 
Um, is was that before we get to the sunshine double uh, uh, or the sunshine pair or whatever you want to call it uh, with Miami? And is there any any tennis that occurred in this few weeks or few months that you want to mention? Maybe Davey wants to say something about some of the tennis that occurred in sort of February, March. Felix, Felix, Felix winning, winning his first title. That yeah, was pretty. Uh, that, that was pretty important, of course, especially when we look at how the the entire year after that went. Definitely. Uh, Alcaraz, I think, winning the the ATP 500 in Rio was pretty huge as well. The rest probably not as yeah. important in the grand scheme of things, but Rublev had a had a super strong um, moment yeah. as well, right? Winning two titles in a row, and also that uh, yeah. was it like a third the final? No, no, there's two titles in a row, right? And then yeah, as you he said, won Dubai, uh, winning a couple. He won Dubai and um, Marseille. Yeah, Marseille. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. I think maybe Golden, Felix Golden winning. Swing was a lot of fun. Yep, Golden I Swing thought. was. So let's 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 yeah. you mean the sort of sunshine, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, this is when Alcaraz now moves into top gear, in my opinion. Uh, what do you think, Jethro? Yeah, I mean, I saw it in in Rio, and it's kind of just really weird to think that was his first ever ATP 500 title, and okay. later in that year he becomes world number one and wins a Grand Slam and two Masters. Um, and yeah, I thought he played really well there. I think he played Diego in the final and just, yeah, I think Diego had played like the most insanely long matches and he was just gone and Alcaraz played so well. And I was like, right, he's here. And then next thing you know, he's in, was it, is it Miami, Miami first? Was it Indian Wells first? Indian Wells first. Indian it's Wells always first. Indian Wells first. Yeah. Um, I'm struggling to remember. Yeah, yeah, okay. And he played great there and he lost to Rafa in that. Crazy mm-hmm. match. Um, it was, crazy. But yeah, no, he was he was really getting quite scary good. Um, and then obviously, you know, won won that Miami title. His um, I really enjoyed his final with Rude. I know he was just had too much quality in the end, but um, I think my favorite stat from that match was the f- four or five games in. Casper's average forehand speed was like ninety one miles an hour or something like that. It was extraordinary. Um, so yeah, a lot of fun tennis over those two weeks. But, um, Definitely. Yeah, I mean, lot, the, the match say. you mentioned with the match you mentioned with Rafa was nuts for the wind in particular. But I also think the level was also nuts. Um, I think that match actually has sort of been forgotten for various reasons. I know Mary Carrillo uh, said at the time that that was match of the year for her. Although man, I'm sure that you could look at other matches since then. I mean, I think Djokovic uh, against Alcaraz in Madrid, which will come to shortly, would would rival that and, and a few others, particularly at ATP. 1,000 level. Taylor Fritz, of course, getting over the line. Him and Rafa basically were the walking wounded in, in that final. Mario, did you see that final? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was like a weird, a weird final because uh, Fritz had, had an issue uh, with his uncle. Some hours before the match, we were not sure if Fritz uh, would have been on court or not. Mm, then, of course, He's been. He went to to the court because the biggest final of his career. Uh, he looked quite good. Obviously, better than Rafa, who was who was also a bit injured. Uh, not a bit because he lost. Um, he lost six, seven weeks of tennis after that. Uh, after that match, um, yeah. so probably not the best final in terms of quality because the two player. We're both not at 100%. Um, but yeah, big credit to, to Taylor Fritz because, uh, yeah, then he, then he proved that uh, it was not a case. That title, that tournament, um, he was also in the semifinals in Indian Wells in the 2021. So um, it's like a special place for him and his own tournament. Um, but yeah, Indian Wells, I I had a lot of fun, and non, not only uh, for the final, but, but also I remember a lot of um, very, very good matches. For example, the match against uh, between Nadal and Kyrgios, um, it was quite, quite entertaining. Um, but yeah, very, very good, very good from Taylor Fritz. And then he, he kept his level throughout all, all the season, ending in Turin and in the top 10. So... Uh, very, very deserved. Damien, any any final thoughts on this spell of the year before we get into the clay court season? 
Yeah, I mean, Fritz winning his first Masters 1000 title in California was pretty huge for him as well, right? Uh, in his home state. And um, especially just breaking through that, that one milestone earlier, getting for, for the first time to a slam second week at the Australian Open, which was, you know, for years we were wondering whether, uh, maybe not whether, but when Taylor Fritz is going to do that. So that was huge, of course. Yeah, I totally agree that the... Uh, Nadal Alcaraz semi, despite the wind, was extremely good. But mo- you know, the quality was high despite the wind, and the storylines, of course, were just amazing. With them, uh, it wasn't their first meeting, right? I mean, Nadal crushed him like in 2021, but you know, right now it was a, an even bigger story that these two guys will will face each other. You know, the the, the great Spaniard against his. Uh, you know, for the media, <laughs> you know, for the headlines, it was always like the, the next Nadal. Even if it didn't make sense, uh, you know, at all, this only only in terms of the nationality, really, and yeah, and then Alcaraz getting uh, getting a title there. I have to I have to say I will keep saying that if we're talking about match of the year contenders, we can't forget about Alcaraz Kitsmanovic in Miami. Okay, uh, nice. but but yeah, I, I would agree with Mario also that in Indian Wells we had a couple of of amazing matches as well, and Kitsmanovic Fritz was was one of them. The the quarter between them between those two. Uh, so yeah, I mean the sunshine double always delivers, I guess, and uh, and yeah, uh, two two made uh, two maiden Masters thousand champions, right? And it, mm. it, they weren't random at all. Like they they actually really deserved these titles and showed it yeah. throughout the rest of the year. I was a big um, fan of um, cool. Sitsa Pass against JJ Wolf. That was a really really oh, yeah. fun match as well. Uh, JJ Wolf hitting left-handed forehand winners all over the all over the place. <laughs> Yeah, JJ was, had a super good, spell good. in uh, in the Sunshine Double, right? Uh, I mean, he, I think yeah. he also played Bautista good in like a a great match that he lost, but yeah, he, mm-hmm. he was he was very strong in that in that time period as well. Yeah, yeah. this year has been strange because we had five masters on hard courts and we had five first time masters winners uh, in all of them because Fritz mm-hmm. Alcaraz in Madrid in Miami and then Carreño Busta, uh, Choric. Uh, Choric and Rune. So five hardwood hmm. masters and five first-time winner. Yep, indeed. Um, okay, let's get into the clay court season. City Pass wins the first uh, Masters 1000 tournament of that spell of the year in, in winning in Monte Carlo. I actually found it the most underwhelming of, of, of wins, if you like, this season in terms of tournaments. Because, uh, listen, there's one person we haven't touched on for a while. And that's Mr. Djokovic, who, of course, was struggling through this period. We saw him lose to Davidic Fakina, for example, in Monte Carlo. I remember a few weeks later as well in Serbia, how every, every match seemed to go to a third set with him losing the first one. It seemed so much so that it almost seemed staged, that he wanted to get the weeks under his legs. Then, of course, we get to Madrid. By the way, anyone, anyone disagree with me about some of my City Pass comments? Maybe I'm being harsh. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Like when when you said that uh, Tsitsipas over Cena was probably the best performance of his year, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. But I think if you say that there's not much competition, that's probably a little harsh. But go on, go uh, on. yeah, I just don't think it was that bad of a year for Tsitsipas. He sort of stabilized at the top. If only he made the final at Ran Garros, for example, we would be calling this uh, probably you know, another step forward. It's just really Paris that brings his ear down for me. And maybe not US, doing anything US at Open. the US Open. Yeah, maybe not doing anything mm. at the US Open for like the hundredth time. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's probably <laughs> that's probably another one. But other like than these two events, uh, he had some, you know, he had a number of good rounds at thousand events. Uh, Monte Carlo, whether it was um, underwhelming, I think it was maybe underwhelming in that sense that he was other than the Schwarzman match, he was probably never really pushed. But, you know, that, that's not really something we can, I think, you know, take as... Um, um, <laughs> he, he dominated the event, simply. And, you know, he, he's defended his title from 2021 as well. We'll see how he does there in 2023. But, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, maybe that's why it feels underwhelming, you know, that he played Davidovich Fokina in the final. But, of course, you can only beat whoever you play in the final and whoever you play along the way. And I don't think the quality of his tennis in Monte Carlo was underwhelming at all. I just mm-hmm. think well, maybe maybe there wasn't, you know, that much, that many classic matches. He crushed Zverev pretty easily. Only, yeah, as I said, only Schwartzman really came close. 
Well, we all know the highlight yeah. of Stepanos's year was really this moment. Uh, we know that that was that was when it reached a peak. Uh, this was just after Indian Wells, I think, or it might have been just after Miami, actually, um, as as they got on the clay court season. So, when that's the highlight of your year, Damien, I, I think uh, I think there's some issues afoot. No, I, I I think with Monte Carlo, it wasn't just you know the final. I mean, Alcaraz lost a quarter in the first round. Um, yeah, right. Djokovic yeah. obviously went out went out to Djokovic was Kina. Yeah, um, but I I still enjoyed it. I thought Sitsipas played really well, and I think defending a title on clay at his age is still really impressive. Um, and I mean, I loved Davidovic for Kina that week personally. I thought he was yeah, so fun. Yeah. I, I, I've I've loved watching him all three surfaces this year actually. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun in, uh, in Monte Carlo. And yeah, it was that crazy match between Tsitsipas and Diego, which I actually missed because I was busy. Um, but yeah, so that yeah, was that was a lot of fun as well. I think in Monte Carlo we had one of the best matches of the year, though. Uh, the quarterfinal between Zverev and Sinner was really, really good. Uh, that was good. Um, probably talking, uh, excluding Grand Slams, probably one of the best, uh, probably the best on clay. Uh, after Djokovic mm -hmm. and Alcaraz yeah. in Madrid, which is uh, out of out of this competition, uh, but yes, for me it's been also a, a good event. I I enjoyed it. Alcaraz goes on to win Barcelona as well. I mean, we could talk about that as well because there was one or two epic matches there. Um, but then we come to Madrid. I'm probably missing one or two tournaments as well, but we we don't have all day. So Madrid. Um, Listen, let's go straight to it. Semi-final, Djokovic, Alcaraz. Uh, give me... Who, who watched this match, by the way? <laughs> okay. Everyone. Jethro, Everyone on what, the planet. Tell me your... Tell me your Because it was, it was perfect timing for us because it was a Saturday afternoon. So it was yeah. really good timing. I think the football it season was, was, had finished, so... It did actually clash with the, the European rugby semi-finals. So I was having to watch about three... Oh, yeah. Everyone, everyone was watching the European <laughs> rugby. Everyone was watching it. Um, so I was having to watch like a million things at once, but it was amazing. Um, I was just, yeah, I was, and also let's not forget, you just beat Nadal as well. We've gone, we've skipped straight yeah. past that. Yeah, I know, but we, we've got to skip certain things. Yeah. And Nadal, of course, um, is making his comeback from the rib injury, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. He doesn't really perform in Madrid as well. So that was, that was just so much on the line in that match, you know, be the first player to beat, beat them back to back. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. it was incredible. Um, yeah, that was kind of, and I obviously where everyone went crazy. That was Alcaraz is kind of bigger. You know, I mean, he already had multiple big arrivals to the to the tour, but um, that was just another level. Yeah, it was it was amazing. He played so well, and it was really tight as well. I mean, there was obviously a few yeah. breaks of serve, but um, go on, go on, uh, Mario, you can take over. No, I uh, for me one of one of those matches uh, uh, that are still good even for the loser because uh, Djokovic clearly needed that, ma that match, that kind of, of battle. Of course, losing a battle against a top rival is not good, but um, it was a big, big step forward uh, for Djokovic. In fact, the week, the week later, uh, a week later in Rome, uh, Djokovic found his level. He, he went that, that master event uh, without losing uh, any set, um, so so yeah, very very entertaining, um, and also in the last season beating Djokovic in the final set tiebreak, it's it's not so easy. Uh, so Alcaraz has has to be proud of what of what he did. Um, incredible week for him. Also looking at the final. Uh, against Zverev, yeah, there, there's been a, a bit of of an argument from from Zverev uh, because of the night sessions, but uh, still in incredible for for Alcaraz. Yeah, yeah great, great match. I did uh, think Zverev Zverev didn't really help himself very much with the match finishing late and then going and hitting Serbs for like over an hour when did he? he could have just gone straight to the ice bath and recover and you know when you people made a lot of fuss about this but i'm i'm kind of like you know it's his job you know when you've got a job you work around your work schedule don't you you don't go and like do these things at stupid o'clock and then complain about not having enough sleep 
So, you know. He knows his was, body, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So. I mean, but if he knows his body, he's, com- I, he's I complaining have... the next day, you know. It's, yeah, yeah, know. he shouldn't be complaining. Of course, of course, yeah. the indoor faster clay also helping um, helping Alcaraz there in that matchup mm-hmm. particularly. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I don't think there's any competition. Alcaraz Djokovic, uh, you know, much, much of the year. Uh, there's the storylines, there's the drama, there's the high quality. Can't really get anything better to, to me. Um, and well, uh, also probably the best Carlos's backhand has looked ever. Like he was just holding up in, in backhand to backhand rallies with Djokovic with total ease, uh, which, you know, usually it's the weaker wing and, and, and definitely not the strongest as his forehand on a, on a normal day. Uh, and also I will keep saying this. I've probably even probably said this on this channel because I, I, I just keep saying this whenever someone wants to listen to me, but uh, there's like no comparison between Alcaraz at the U S open and Alcaraz in Madrid for me, that was by far the best Carlos has played in 2022. I don't care that he won the grand slam. I, I, I don't, I don't give a damn in the spring. I, yeah. In general, I think he was much stronger than the yeah. latter half of the year, the return, yeah, um, especially. Yeah. So uh, yeah, in, insane, insane week for him, and yeah, beating Nadal and Djokovic back to back. I honestly totally forgot about the Nadal match. Like, I, I yeah. just keep thinking about this uh, this Djokovic clash. It keeps popping up on Twitter when people talk about the matches of the year, and, and I just, you know, uh, if you asked me like whether Nadal, whether Alcaraz beat um, Nadal this year, I probably would have found it. But yeah, it just. Uh, fish, you know, hid in the shadows when it when it compares. It, it doesn't compare to. Uh, to yeah. Alcaraz Djokovic, which is pretty wild as well. Agree, agree. And listen, this is a unique moment, Damien. I think it's the first time you and I are in, in complete agreement on this show so <laughs> far. Uh, we have agreed in the past, by the way, viewers. So check out the the backlog of of, of episodes with Damien and Arna. We don't always disagree, but I, I would agree with you that, that Alcaraz, I would look at it as a block really from, I mean, I, I think somebody mentioned Rio almost. You could go back that far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe even Australia. I mean, I think the Berrettini match was was insane. I remember the two or three matches before the Berrettini match was super high, but particularly during the, the North American hardcourt swing in, in the spring, uh, the European spring, as if, if you like, uh, all the way through until Rome, which he didn't play. Uh, so, so basically, yeah, through Madrid, that was his best body of work. He just pulled out two or three really good performances in, in, in New York, uh, cinema being obvious, but he was, he was nothing special until the cinema match in a way he was struggling mm-hmm. to beat Chilich, I think in the previous round, um, you know, Sinna had similar issues as well, but from that moment onwards for the rest of the tournament, I don't think his level was as high again in the semifinal, the final in New York, but we'll, we'll come to that again, uh, shortly. Uh, at least we're now in the European summer. At one point when we had 44 minutes on the clock and we were still talking about Nadal Medvedev, I was like, my goodness me. <laughs> but we've managed to get through the clay court swing in particular at a, at a great pace. Um, and now we are in Rome. And for me, this is my... The, the big image for me from Rome was was this one. Jethro, what hap- what's happening here? Yeah, this, this was against Shapovalov and... Rafa's yep. foot flared up really, really bad, and it was really, it was really, really sad. Um, I was gutted, and I thought, he's, "There's no way he's going to win the French Open." You know, he's he's not even going to get through this match. And you know, to his credit, he let Shapovalov win it rather than rather than retire. But yeah, it was he. You could just see how emotionally, you know, affected he was by. You know, by how much pain he was in, it was so disappointing and so close to the French Open. It was, um, it was really worrying. But um, yeah, we can come on to what happened afterwards later. But yeah, at the time, it was, it was, it was not good. He won the first set against Shapovalov. He also said in his press conference afterwards that's the best he'd played since coming back from the rib injury, if you like, uh, you know, through Madrid. And then he started to say, listen, I started to feel my form being at a great level. Shapovalov goes to win it, but there's bigger concerns. I think, I mean, the, the, the French Open, I think, is 10 days later, basically. It's starting 10 days later. And I, I just couldn't see how he would even take the court. Never mind. Bearing in mind, He'd had this injury, you know, he's been having it nonstop throughout his life, but but in particular it flared up last year and we didn't see him for six months. I could only see a similar scenario. I don't know what you thought, Mario. I don't know why, but uh, I've never had um, really a doubt that Nadal would have been playing in Paris. Mm, 
I um, yeah, uh, that the, the end of that match was clearly um, uh, bad for him and sad for for all of us watching him. Uh, but um, I don't know. I st um, I still know that uh, um, Rafa uh, struggled a lot lately uh, through the last year in Rome when it comes to playing the evening. Uh, I remember him losing to Wawrinka, to Schwartzman. Um, yeah, then also that match he was struggling in the end with the foot. I remember uh, at some moment he was like uh, on, uh, <laughs> on the clock, um, breathing heavily. Um, but I don't know. I don't know why I was I was one hundred percent confident that he would have been um, okay playing in Paris. I I had that feeling since the beginning. Okay, uh, I must say I didn't have that feeling, but there we go. Anyway, listen. Let's get back to the tournament itself. Djokovic ends up beating Tsitsipas in the final. Um, uh, I don't think any of us were surprised at that, given how their head to head has been and and still is really. Uh, the only thing that surprised me really was that that uh, Sitsipas pushed him so close at Paris Bercy um, uh, six some six months later. But listen, now we're going into the French Open, and uh, before the French Open, uh, I remember um, basically when Nadal had beaten, I think it was John Isner, I think in Rome um, before that Shapovalov match, and I was asked the question about who was my favourite for the French Open. And I said, give me another three or four days because Nadal and Djokovic were on course to play in the semifinals in, in Rome. And I, I thought that that... Oh, sorry, I miss no, I th in Rome. think semis. Yeah. Yeah, I Rome. think semis yeah, in Rome right. because um, at that stage, Nat Rafa's um, ranking was still pretty high. Um, uh, it was actually because he went out so early and Sitsipas gets to the final that we end up getting the lopsided draw that we got in, in, in Paris. Um, but anyway, I wanted to see. I want to see what happens in Rome, and that was going to tell me who my prediction was for Paris. We what we see was, of course, Alcaraz wasn't there. Uh, Rafa has the injury. Djokovic wins that tournament. For me, going into the French Open, I had Djokovic as a pretty clear favourite. I mean, maybe not pretty clear, but I, I wasn't in any doubt about choosing him as my favourite. What were you thinking, Damien? Probably between Djokovic and Alcaraz, uh, like. Of course, if I were was to name the three main favorites, it would be Nadal as well. But I thought yeah. he was like a pretty distant, um, uh, you know, pretty distant third compared to these two. But Alcaraz, there was always this concern that it's still very early in his career, even though he does kind of seem to be, you know, built different. That he maybe doesn't feel the pressure that some other youngsters in the past have felt. Uh, I think we saw that at, at the at the French Open that actually maybe he does. He was unable to hit through Zverev and at the uh, in the quarterfinals, of course, uh, which was especially striking compared to the final in Madrid. Very different conditions though, so it's kind of understandable. And Zverev probably played his best uh, tournament of the year. Uh, but there was also that struggle against Ramos Vinolas in the second round, which. Uh, again, was pretty much Carlos's rally tolerance not being there, which is an, an issue for him, of course, a lot of the time. And it's probably why there's even a discussion, like whether he's better on clay or on hard courts. Uh, so, so, yeah, there was definitely that uh, sort of a question mark with Alcaraz, whereas with Djokovic after Rome, no one really had any question marks. Like His level in Rome was just so insane. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, their quarterfinal at, uh, at the French, Nadal and Djokovic, this was only the third time that Nadal wasn't the favorite coming into a match at Roland Garros. Uh, the, the past two being, of course, against Djokovic in 2015, which he which he lost, also the quarters, and the semi against Federer in to, back in 2005, which he which he won, of course. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I think um, most people would agree with you no, and agreed with you in May that Djokovic was the top favorite coming into the final, uh, coming into Paris. Yeah, because we didn't know if Nadal's foot was going to hold up. I remember a lot of Twitter discussions about, uh, you know, maybe Nadal has to win his early matches in straights, you know, so, so just limit his time on the court so that he has more for the final rounds. And yeah, and he's ultra vulnerable against Ojar Aliasim, although Felix played a very good match, but, you know, this still wasn't yeah. like Nadal, the, the Nadal that won. 14 Ron Garros uh, titles at that point, 13. 
uh, so he was at least in the forefront. He was pretty vulnerable, and yeah, and I, I don't think anyone really expected, especially after the the, the not you know Djokovic beating him in 2021. But I guess this rivalry, their rivalry in Paris, has sort of uh, subverted these expectations a lot because I think after the 2020 final, we just thought that Nadal was gonna you know keep crushing Djokovic whenever they play. So. I've got I've got each of the three most recent clashes between them at the French Open completely wrong. In 2020, I had Djokovic as, uh, winning that uh, one way or another, and Nadal crushed him. I had 2021 because it was only seven eight months later, uh, going into that semi final in Paris, and, and Nadal was playing pretty yeah. well. I thought that year I had him beating Djokovic, and of course Djokovic wins. Um, and again this year, I had a Djokovic down as the winner. Partly because, as you said, that Rafa had struggled to beat him. I mean, for various reasons we already expect. But everything I had seen until that quarterfinal had supported, to some extent, yeah. my doubts and my my conviction about both players. And Djokovic, Jethro, uh, beat a certain guy in a very comfortable fashion in the fourth round. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, well, Djokovic was really it was just so impressive you know in that Rome to to the quarterfinal stretch of the French Open anyway um and you know DA Schwartzman's had so much success at the French Open you know over the last kind of five years or so and he wasn't having the best year um kind of just really just seemed a level below you know 2020 he was you know really quite elite and 2021 2022 he just was just a bit of a level below and then he played against Dimitrov in the third round and just utterly annihilated him you know and he'd, he'd okay. been two sets love down against Muna and it was like shorts was looking like he's going out and then came back just like literally like Dimitrov just couldn't you know do anything against him and I was like you know what I think he's actually going to give Djokovic a good game I don't think he's going to win but I think he's going to make it really tight and I like, was completely negating the fact that Djokovic just does everything he that Diego does but better you know he's got an advantage on everything you know he's got the more he's got a better serve he's got about height he's got better everything um and yeah just annihilated him and then I was like well Djokovic and that was one of for me one of Djokovic's best performances of the year actually apart from you know the first three games of the third set and so and then and I saw Rafa struggling against Felix and I was like I just think there's only one winner I think Djokovic in four I thought was gonna happen but yeah, then didn't, didn't go. That I way, thought so. something, something like that, and uh, and in fact, the first set and a half, we know that Rafa, of course, won the first set. Was a was three love up with two breaks. Djokovic still manages to win that second set. So now I'm thinking, well, he's going to win this in four. What I will say is, during the fourth set, when Novak was a break up throughout most of that fourth set, I did for the first time, if you like, get one of my predictions right. I mean, it was a change of match prediction, if you like. But I sensed, despite the fact he was a breakdown in that fourth set, I thought, hang on a second. Rafa thinks he's got this. I think his team think he's got this. He was pushing Novak on his serve. Uh, he was winning his service matches or games, sorry, comfortably, even though he was that early breakdown. And even though Novak, of course, had set points, once he broke back, whether he won or lost that tie break, I think Rafa thought, and I started, at least that's what I was feeling. I was sensing certain things. Anyway, either way, he did win it. Um, of course, he then goes on to play Zverev in the semi final. I was in Paris. I was with Owen that day, funnily enough. Um, uh, Owen Lewis uh, and I were in the stadium for the Zverev semi final. Uh, that was a bizarre match um, for the length of time it was, in terms of the fact that obviously I think it was about three hours and the second set hadn't even finished yet. That match could have easily gone six or seven hours, may even have contributed to Zverev's injury in the end. There's a lot to be said about that match and unpacked. Nadal was insane in that tie break, obviously being 6-2 down. Meanwhile, on the other side of the draw, we've got Damien's friend Stefanos Tsitsipas, who's had a pretty good year. Uh, what happened to him at the French Open, Damien? Yeah, I mean that, that that's one of the two regrets. Uh, I don't want to sound like a like a Stefan Tsitsipas fan because I'm definitely not. Like honestly, on most of these matches, I'm I'm pretty neutral. Uh, but I, I guess you know he, he he played one of the most talented players of the younger generation. But you know, seeing that in 2021 he was so close to winning Grand Garros, 
uh, I think you know Tsitsipas was probably the main. Like if you if you just uh, looked at the fact that in the top half there's so many um, you know so many so all the main favorites are there like Djokovic, Nadal, Alcaraz, even Zverev, uh, then you you know you you had to imagine that if Djokovic has to come through Nadal and Alcaraz for example, then in the final he's going to be a bit drained. So I think Tsitsipas was still one of the main favorites going into the French, and yeah, he just uh, lost to Rune, which in hindsight looks a lot better than it looked in May. Even though, you know, knowing Holger's potential, he was still uh, so much rower than he is right now. Uh, so as, especially as we thought that in best of five play, Rune wouldn't hold up physically, right? The cramping that he had constantly. Uh, even at the Australian Open, he lost to Sun Wuk Won in five sets um, due to that. And then, yeah, the French, he just sort of decided, I have to win every match quickly. <laughs> and, and he was, he was uh, you know, doing very well physically, even though the, the week before, I think he played in Lyon and he was constantly cramping again. So it was pretty weird. Yeah, definitely along with the Galan loss, that's uh, that's the two worst moments of Tsitsipas' season, even though I, th- I thought the level was actually pretty decent. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the bottom half became a bit of a mess. But I guess then... I know after Tsitsipas, it was Ruth who was the next favorite to make it. It was just a little disappointing because honestly, I will say that I didn't watch the final. I was uh, that week I was in Poznan for the Challenger, and they started the final at the exact same time, uh, 3 p.m. Um, 3 p.m. local time for for both events, of course. And I just didn't even care enough to take out my phone and watch in the stands. I just knew that this was going to be a mismatch. match from start to finish like that 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 it was not going to be watchable uh i'm usually as i said i'm usually very neutral due to these especially these matches at the latter stages of slams but i was really rooting for chilich in the semifinals because i felt like you know if he's peaking he can beat nadal and there's okay. just similarly to what jeffro said about schwarzman Djokovic, there's just nothing casper can do in in paris in that match maybe maybe this version of casper could have done something um <laughs> But it felt felt like this version of Casper was the same Casper that turned up eight years later. Yeah. Uh, Mario, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that final and, and generally the Casper Rude Nadal matchup? Uh, well, yeah, he, it was uh, a bit of disappointing final, but I I agree with Damien. I I was expecting something like that, uh, but I enjoyed the um, Rune throughout the event. I remember him playing uh, a great match against Rune in the quarterfinals. Um, I don't know. There's there's nothing um, there's nothing to say when when the things goes so clear in favor of one tennis player. For example, in that final, uh, Rafa played Rune uh, Ru- Rude. Um, yeah, the matchup not favorable. Uh, to Casper, but probably I don't know. Still, uh, it was like uh, I don't know how much he believed to um, to be able to take that trophy that day. I don't know. It was like when um, uh, when you you take a, a, a child to show something incredible, and he's like, oh. Um, <laughs> you know, I had, I had like that, um, that feeling in that moment. Uh, he was in, enjoying uh, being there, but without that, um, uh, that enough grit to, um, to put Rafa in some difficult situation. Fair yeah. enough, Jethro. Have you got any final thoughts on the French Open as a whole? Yeah, no, I agree, and yeah, I think. I hope it fades away, but you know his kind of love and respect for Rafa and Novak is um, is definitely holding him back. You know, I think even if Zverev didn't, you know, break his ankle, I still think Rafa was coming through that match eventually. You know, fifteen hours later, okay. dragging them out, you know, on in body bags. Um, and I think if Rude got Zverev in that final, I think we would have seen a completely different Casper Reed turn up. You know played so excellently against Rune, against Chilich and just, you know, obviously Chilich, you know, I think it's a bigger danger to Rude than Zverev possibly on clay. Um, Ooh. But that's just my personal, just because not 
in general, but the way Chilich was playing this year, Roland Garros, you know, he's mm-hmm. just peaking against Rublev and Medvedev, and he was playing really nicely. And you know, I would have fancied his chances a lot more against Zverev than against than against Rafa. And I think um, his kind of love and respect for um for the you know what the big two now isn't it? Um, but the big three and stuff is is holding him back. And he's such a nice guy. And I think he just needs a bit more, yeah, a bit more grit and a bit more like, okay, I'm seriously going to take it to these guys. Um, that's kind of what he needs next season, really. Okay, grass court season. Berrettini is looking like, hang on a second. I think he's <sighs> even better than he was last year. Uh, I think he I think he might have dropped a set on the way to the uh, title in Stuttgart in the final, I think against Murray um, amongst others. But uh, in I think in Queens, he didn't drop a set. Either way, I watched a fair bit of the grass court season in the build up to Wimbledon and I had him down as my clear second favorite. I know some people may have had Rafa and that's fair enough, but I thought, hang on a second, this guy is playing better than a year ago. I thought, and we hadn't seen much of Djokovic, but other than the defeat he had against Rafa, there was actually funny enough, the doubts now started to circle Djokovic for once going into Wimbledon. Um, I still thought Djokovic was the favorite, um, and in particular because I thought the back against the wall attitude, a lot of people were saying, well, he's under pressure. And I was like, yeah, but it's a different kind of pressure. There's the pressure from leading from the front and the opposition chasing you down. That's a pressure. And that's worse than back against the wall, come out fighting. That kind of pressure is when we see Novak excel. And we saw that on several occasions throughout Wimbledon. But um, any thoughts on the grass court season? Uh, Her- Hubi Hercatch, of course, winning in Halle. Um Go on, Mario. No, Hubi Urkacz played uh, a great, great tournament in Halle, uh, beating Kyrgios in a, in a very close match in Halle, then picking against Medvedev in a matchup quite favorable to Urkacz, I have to say. Um, I Because I saw uh, Urkacz playing very good matches against Medvedev, uh, but it was very, very impressive that day. Um, yeah, I I was a bit. Uh, I know that Davidovich Fokina is uh, um, a bad opponent for a Grand Slam first round uh, if you are a seeded player, but I don't know. I I felt like it, it was a, a big shock, uh, even because he he was able to to recover from being down uh, zero two. Um, yeah, so we had like that shock to start. Wimbledon on Monday. Um, then another shock was Berrettini with COVID, <laughs> because uh, yeah, he was he was the heavy favorite. Yeah, uh, probably a bit lucky in Stuttgart against Murray because Murray was struggling physically in the end, but he he was still looking to to take it uh, to take the title anyway. Uh, yeah, probably Berrettini and Durkac was the two guys. Uh, mm, but they they were out since the beginning. So probably in a, a quite surprising way, um, beside Rafa, uh, there was still Kyrgios since the beginning as one of the favorite guys. Uh, because we were seeing some quite good things in the tournaments before, before Wimbledon. And having mm-hmm. Urkacz and Berrettini out, probably Kyrgios already knew that he he had this chance and took it, that it was a great run for him. Jethro, you Chilich were that as well. Win. Chilich as well, oh, so okay, was, yeah. On, the, on, that, on that same side of the draw as well. So, yeah, that was a shame. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, go um, So, did, did Chilich pull out through COVID, did he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I and think but, he won his first good match. as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, RBA, yeah. And you know what? I was in a room with RBA uh, the day. Ju- he just won his uh, match in the first round. And listen, I didn't know who he'd beaten. I didn't know what had happened. But I'm in a hallway in the bowels of Wimbledon. And they said, does anybody want to speak to RBA? Because they have their press conferences. And then after the press conference, they may go into a small room where if you're very lucky, like if you want to speak to Rafa, you know, if you work for Telecinco or Movistar, whoever the, the, the rights holders are in Spain, you might get him for an interview or a top radio station, but I'm not going to get Rafa in a room, put it that way. But nobody seemed to want RBA. So I was like, 
yeah, I'll, I'll have a, I'll have a chat with RBA in, in, in a little room. So we, we go off into this room, just me and him. And I'm thinking, I have no idea how he's done today. I think he's won. So the first question was, it's just me and him sat around a round table. And I just said, um, how was that today then? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, good because of X, Y, and Z. And then I said, well, you know, you got to the semi-final in, in 2019, I think it was. Uh, are you aiming that high again? And, you know, it's a long way before then, all the usual stuff. Anyway, uh, 24 hours later, he was out of Wimbledon with COVID. So um, RBA, I don't think it was me. I, I tested negative at various <laughs> points throughout the tournament. But um, there we go. I hope I didn't scupper your your one and only chance maybe of winning the tournament. But uh, listen, that's that's a, a true story. Jethro, listen, you were at Wimbledon uh, as well this year. Uh, what are your, because which, which day did you go and what match or matches did you see? I went on the first Friday and okay. just took a general grounds pass and met up with a mm -hmm. bunch of people from uh, Popcorn Tennis. And then I also went on the men's quarterfinals Tuesday. So I was on court okay. one and well, women's quarterfinals as well, of course. So I got Tatiana Miri against... Ooh. Against a German opponent, no? Um, yeah. Johnny Meyer. Johnny yeah, Meyer. Johnny right. Meyer, that's the one. That was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Cam Norrie against David Goffin. Oh, wow. Five out, setter, right? Packed out court one, five sets. It was amazing. Great. Such a fantastic match. Yeah, very happy to be at that. That would have been um, happening at the same time as Sina Djokovic, was it? Yeah, and that start, I think they, yeah, they, what they did was they started Maria v. Niemeyer at the same time as Sina Djokovic. So we could hear screams, you know, from, from Sina winning the first two sets. Um, and then that went in. I think as that match ended, a few more people used their court one tickets to come watch the Nori Goffin match because they'd been watching on Henman Hill. And yeah, it was just an amazing atmosphere. It was like being a kind of like an Andy Murray match, you know, everyone's just going crazy for Nori. Um, it was it was brilliant. Um, so that was definitely my favorite. And I caught caught a few things on the Friday. Um, saw a bit of Tommy Paul against Yuri Vesely. Was very impressed with Tommy Paul. Um, caught a bit of Sebastian Byers and doubles. That was cool because I hadn't seen him play yet. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of fun. I'll be going a lot more next year, hopefully. Christian Garin, if I'm right in this uh, in this uh, uh, um, assessment. I think he was the biggest beneficiary of Mario Berrettini's unfortunate COVID positive test because I think they were due to take the court that yep. day and uh, Berrettini test positive. And I had Berrettini in Nadal semi-final. Like I said before, maybe some people thought Berrettini would prevail. Some thought Rafa, but whatever. I thought it was going to take an incredible performance to stop Berrettini. Well, unfortunately, it was an incredible virus that stopped him. And that opened things up. I mean, listen, the parting of the seas then for Christian Garin, who then finds himself in a quarterfinal, I think it was. That's how far he got as a result of that. Um, and on top of that, I actually posed a question to, to Christian Garin. I said, Christian, how many um, how many grass courts are there in Chile? And he said, none. There's none. <laughs> Don't have any grass courts. I said, well, you're doing all right anyway. But he goes out at the quarterfinal stage, if I'm right. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's quarterfinal, not the fourth round. Yeah. Um, Djokovic does prevail against Sinner in five sets. I don't think it didn't feel like a five set match because at no point did I really think that Djokovic wasn't going to win that, even as early as the beginning of the third set. Um, so he he keeps on going. He gets to the semi final. I was at the Rafa Fritz match on I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm going to say Wednesday. I'm pretty sure it was the Wednesday actually. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, epic match. Um, I do have it in one of my episodes or four matches of the year, but I completely understand how it wouldn't fall into that category. But I put put out about 20 matches. I could find people for seven of them. And one of those matches who was there in attendance, I, I put a load of matches to Robbie Koenig, the South African commentator. And he said, the only one I was at, because I mentioned Alcaraz, Djokovic, I mentioned Djokovic, Runa, even a few other slam matches as well. Uh, Felix, Medi, I think. And he just said, that's the one I was at. I said, all right, let's do an episode on that. And it was dramatic. Uh, of course, it was dramatic partly because of, of the fact that Rafa obviously was injured. And, and I saw it from the middle of the first set because Rafa goes up a, an early break. And having had a few dodgy matches before then, those first four games, Rafa was just like, oh, my God, he, he could win. With this level, he could win Wimbledon. But there was a smash 
there was a few smashes in that first four or five games, which is also indicating how much on top he was of, of a very capable opponent in table Taylor Fritz. But there was a smash, and I don't know, and I'll, I'll never know probably unless I get to pose the question to Rafa at some point in the future. There was a smash, and I thought, hang on a sec, from that moment onwards, it was never quite the same. I then saw him warming up on the Thursday. There were some images on TV. I wasn't at Wimbledon on the Thursday, but I saw some images, and I, he was just barely serving. He was just sort of doing this, and... And you could see it just wasn't working. Calls a press conference for the Thursday night from that moment onwards. You knew his Wimbledon was done. Nick Kyrgios benefiting largely from that, perhaps also from one or two other withdrawals that we mentioned. Nick Kyrgios, though, going into the final against Djokovic. Did anybody, Damien, did you think Kyrgios had a chance or even more than a chance? Yeah, I, I I thought he had a pretty decent chance. Of course, Kyrgios was always, you know, f finding ways to get himself going for the most important matches. I just think he must have played, like, if he was to win this one, he had to play against a slightly less sharp version of Djokovic because he was just, you know, Kyrgios is serving, especially, like, the, 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 the placements that he was hitting was insane. But for a long, for some long stretches in this match, this was the only way he was winning points, basically. And uh, the the way he was serving, I think he just had to run into Djokovic, who was just you know not a beast that he was on the day. Uh, we mentioned the the Djokovic Federer uh, final in 2019, where Djokovic was just mediocre. And I think if if he played Djokovic on that day. You know that, that there was a very good chance that he was winning. Uh, of course, with Kyrgios, there was also a lot of uh, physical question marks, uh, which he sort of, um, you know, we never really checked whether they would have come into play because he, well, with the playstyle that he has, he is very good at saving up energy. I just think on the day Djokovic was too sharp. Uh, of course, you know, looking at the whole tournament, I don't, th I think Kyrgios's level was pretty insane. I, I definitely, uh, you know. It was important that Bertini, Cilic, Bautista, good, such important contenders were out. But it's not like Kyrgios didn't deliver, at least in most matches. Uh, I had him as the favorite against Nadal if they would have played. But I also thought Fritz was going to beat Nadal, um, yeah. which I was, well, again, this was, you know, was I wrong? I guess I was, because I thought it was going to be a little bit cleaner, probably. Uh, Nadal was very up and down in this event. So that, that's why yeah. that's why I kind of figured, yeah. In that, in that, mm -hmm. in the first two rounds, which you uh, you, you mentioned earlier, that there was some some moments of fragile, be, him being fragile. Uh, Serundolo Berankis, they both had like a set against Nadal where yeah. uh, they completely dominated the, the rallies. And then I thought that maybe Sonego was going to beat Nadal. And of course, that's when Nadal <laughs> actually started playing some insane tennis on the grass again. And of yeah. course, um, over the years, it, it, it's uh, it's always a huge storyline that Nadal hasn't been in a Wimbledon final for years, but whenever he plays, at least after that 2012 to, to 2016 stretch that he had, 2017 mm -hmm. even, that he had, that was pretty poor. I don't think he played in 2016. Since then, he's actually always done pretty well at Wimbledon. Maybe he's not making finals, right? So, of course, yeah. Kyrgios, another time. Uh, the, it, it was another big um, opportunity for Kyrgios, another slice of luck. But yeah, I, I, I thought there was a big chance he was going to get Djokovic. Uh, but yeah, as I said, I, I just don't think he could have really handled Djokovic, who was that sharp on the final on, on the day. You know, Djokovic, who didn't really have any lulls like against Nori, like against Sinner. Um, mm. Djokovic, who was pretty much perfect from the beginning to end. His return, oh, in particular, in the second from the second set onwards, the return. Mm. I remember at various points as well that he said he got he began to get a good read on the Nick serve. Mario, what are your thoughts on the final? Yeah, I agree with saying that uh, Djokovic, uh, not not a big surprise, but Djokovic returned uh, incredibly well throughout all the tournament. I remember, for example, um, the third set against Van Rijthoven, third and fourth set, after Van Rijthoven won the second set, then mm -hmm. Djokovic returned unbelievably good. Uh, and so he did also, uh, as the match progressed, also against Sinner, Nori, and then against Kyrgyz in the final. I remember him in the first set, he wasn't reading very well his serve, but after that, um, and it was pretty good at, at a contest, probably after the first set. Yeah, the, the last set went to a tiebreak, 
but I yeah. don't know, in the second, in the third, and in the fourth, I I was sure Djokovic was uh, was taking it. Uh, but it was a good final, an enjoyable tennis. Uh, um, yeah, Djokovic won last four uh, editions of Wimbledon. So, um, yeah, probably his chances were not so high, considering all uh, also Djokovic history in, in this tournament. Um, I have to say, I think Kyrgios did play very well, possibly with the exception of that tiebreak. I think, I know yeah. it's just seven or eight points because it was, I think it was either 7-0 or 7-1. But there was one particular mm. shot he put into the, was it Was it more than that? Tell me, Damien. Yeah, 7-3, so I think. Okay, 7-3. Definitely not 7-1 one... One or 7-0. Okay. I think he there did one... lead 6-1 at one point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, but, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, there was one shot he put into the, the to the net, which looked like he just wanted the rally over with rather than any sort of belief. Um, I think also Djokovic had sapped that belief, as we know that famous quote from Roddick from a few years ago. Um, uh, I do think that 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 I then, as soon as it became a rally, it was like, okay, well, this this point is going to go Djokovic's way, and perhaps Nick sensed that too. Um, any other thoughts on Wimbledon, Jethro, uh, as a whole? Any memories or, or something that I've missed? Yeah, a couple of things. So, yeah, the final, I actually did miss it. I was at the theatre that day, um, but I've caught up on all the highlights and everything since. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was very similar to the djokovic Berrettini final from last year. Um, mm -hmm. Kyrgios, obviously, has got a better backhand than Berrettini, much better. He's got that flat hit. But I'd probably take Berrettini's forehand because it's just heavier and uh, more reliable. Um, and serve, I'd probably... It'd be slightly Kyrgios, probably a bit more, but Berrettini's very close. Um, and despite having a much better backhand than Berrettini, there wasn't really a whole lot of difference between those two results. You know, both peaked really well in the first set when they needed to, but Djokovic just has all the answers, which just speaks to the level of Djokovic. Um, for me, the highest quality match of the entire tournament was Jack Draper against Alex de Minor in the second round. I okay. don't know if anyone will agree with that, but in terms of high quality tennis... That it was, was very me, good. It was very good for sure. I don't yeah. know if I'd go that far, but yeah. Yeah, not of the year, but just of the tournament. I yeah, for me, it was the highest yeah, quality. Sure. I thought the first week, I, there wasn't that many spectacular mm -hmm. individual performances apart from Domino in that match, personally. This is just my opinion. Um, and I thought it was a real shame that Domino choked that lead against Guerin and didn't get to that quarterfinal against Kyrgios. I was very disappointed in that, personally. Yeah, because yeah. for the yeah. minor, this was also like the the, the first uh, and only chance, right? It, it felt like mm. that because of yeah. all the withdrawals that Alex the uh, minor, if he's winning a slam or getting to a final, it could be now. Uh, but yeah. yeah, now now it's kind of forgotten because he led Garin two and zero, and of course, even mm. if Garin is pretty decent on grass for a for a clay quarter, I would say uh, he's he definitely mm -hmm. is quite flat for for a clay quarter, right? So that 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 helps him a lot, I think. Serve return, yeah. serve. He's good. Return, he's good. So I, I think that helps him. Of course, he was also in Wimbledon forefront. Yeah, that was that was super disappointing. And I also wanted to say that one very forgotten individual performance, but not a great match, of course, was Alcaraz over Otte in the third round. That was I like one of the the moments where everyone thought that you know this could be an upset. Otte had a phenomenal grass court season, and Carlos mm -hmm. comes out and just crushes every ball, destroys him completely. He hits winners from every single spot on the court. Of course, he didn't deliver again in the in the fourth round against Sinner, but that this is one of these matches where you can kind of see that you know with enough experience, Alcaraz could be a, a threat to win Wimbledon in the future. Because of course, that's always a, a bit of an issue that with grass being a novelty surface, all the youngsters just don't have much experience on it. The the I was at the Sinner Alcaraz match, but I had to leave at the end of the third set, unfortunately. So it was two sets to one as I left, and I think Alcaraz had just won that third set. And you thought, well, could be a comeback um, here, especially as I think that as, as you say that performance against Otto as well. And I actually thought Alcaraz would beat Sinner going into that match, but I think I also had Sinner to beat him at the U.S. Open. So uh, my predictions again <laughs> in 2022 left a lot to be desired. Um, but listen, one thing I one thing about Alcaraz and, and Grass and, and Wimbledon and stuff, I think you're absolutely right, Damien. He he will get there, whether it be next year or the year after, and he's going to have an excellent run and he may well pick up a couple of Wimbledon titles in his career because I think he's a fast learner. Um, on top of that, 
Uh, he seemed to be having a lot of fun at Wimbledon. Every day he was on social media, on Twitter anyway, posting pictures that, uh, in his home, having some sort of Spanish breakfast with ham and, and toast and stuff in what was a, a classic, albeit quite posh London home that was obviously being rented out for a couple of weeks, which is generally how the players live, certainly at the top level. In It's quite unique in that respect. I think most other tournaments, they're staying in hotels. But at, in London, at Wimbledon, they tend to stay in apartments and, and houses. Uh, for a couple of weeks. And I think he had a lot of fun there and, and I can't wait to see him back next year. Jethro, moving on. From from now, from Wimbledon to US Open, uh, memories. For me, Borna Chorich is the first name that comes to my head and, and that win in uh, Cincinnati, I think it was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Any other any other thoughts for you, Jethro, on this period of the year? Um, yeah, Pablo Corona Busto getting his first Masters 1000 title was awesome. I was so happy. That was a him. great uh, match, by the way. That was yeah, a really good match. Probably doesn't quite feature in match of the year and understand, so, but it was really exciting anyway. Yeah. Really exciting. He played an amazing tournament. His, I think he beat Berrettini in the first round, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. And served just yep. incredibly. And I was just like, this is the best I've ever seen him serve. And I've always felt he should have been the finalist in the 2020 US Open and he's played he's made semis there in 2017 as well always just thought he's just really fun to watch um I know he's had his mental mental issues and matches and not closing them out and you know there's that infamous Nishikori match from the Australian Open all those years ago where he lost lost the plot but yeah so I was so happy for him um really pleased personal favorite match from that period is um Schwartzman v David Shakina in Montreal Simply just like the, it was a really, really exciting match, and uh, the ball striking was just insane. They're both great ball strikers, and it was just one of the most satisfying matches to watch from a neutral view. And as a Diego fan, like that was that was a really great win. So yeah, those are my highlights. Just on that her catch match against um, Pablo Carreño Busta, by the way, um, uh, there was an insane rally in that uh, yeah. match in the third set. Mario, can you remember it? Yeah, I remember um, Carino Busta made like a hot shot. Um, yeah, it, it was it was an, a nice match, I remember. Uh, and overall, a nice tournament. Um, I enjoyed a lot watching uh, watching the, the guys playing in, in Montreal. And I was incredibly happy too also for Carino Busta because I, I, I like a lot these stories of perseverance and of these players which at a certain stage of their career after having had um, a lot of great results then find the strength and the way also to um, to manage to to pass the later round uh, of some big events to uh, to take an important title to to crown their career uh, even if it's not finished um and by the way, I also remember uh, a good uh, a good clay court swing after Wimbledon uh, yeah. with some great matches. For example, I remember the final, even if only 250 between Sinner and Alcaraz, mm -hmm. uh, in which Sinner played probably his best match of the career so far. Because uh, okay. after after having lost in in the tiebreak the first set, I I think he did like six one six one playing incredibly mm -hmm. well, but also a first title for, for Musetti in Hamburg. Um, yeah, so uh, it was it was a period uh, we saw many different winners. Um, also, Borna Cioric's story was incredible, given um, given that we, we, we weren't expecting anything from Cioric uh, probably this year. Uh, he was kind of struggling uh, a bit um, after having re returned from the injury, uh, but then he he had also quite a difficult run because he had to beat also Rafa even if uh, in his first match in his comeback match, but then Titi passed in the final, um, so it it wasn't uh, it wasn't easy uh, as a run. Uh, incredible i think that uh he, sh he should also win the comeback uh, the comeback award because he he, he did something amazing uh mm -hmm. he, he it's been a great story that one um give us some thoughts on paul charge damien yeah <laughs> very happy to i was actually planning to do that 
Uh, and comeback of the year, I think, yeah, Chorich or Ibing Wu is, is is probably the best choice. Uh, I find it hard to you know predict who uh, who the players will, will choose. But of course, Ibing came back after three years. But Chorich is the one who made the comeback into the uh, you know, winning his best, winning winning the, the the biggest tournament of his career and such a huge one. Yeah, I, I was totally not expecting it, uh, especially as in the summer it seemed like he was very up and down. Sometimes playing some great stuff and sometimes just um, yeah struggling and not really being able to find that much rhythm again. Uh, I always compare this Cincinnati run to the Parma Challenger, which he won in June, which sounds kind of funny. But this was uh, very similar in that uh, his serve and forehand were just functioning at such, uh, you know, at, at a level so much higher than usually in his career before the injury. Because, well, you know, he, he never had a big serve or anything. Uh, from the forehand, it was always a struggle for him to inject pace. That's why he played this ultra passive tennis that was honestly super boring to watch. And I remember, you know, before his injury, I never watched Borna Chorich matches. Uh, <laughs> they were just a, a drag for me. And then in June, yeah, there comes the Parma Challenger. He suddenly serves so well. He hits the forehand very aggressively, comes into the net. And I had so much fun watching Borna Chorich do that. And I would never, you know, think that in two months from there, he would he would win his first Masters 1000 title, play a very similar game in that sense because he also was suddenly using his forehand offensively and yeah hitting hitting the serve like never before, and and yeah uh, the the fact that he was able to do that was just insane and of course one of the one of the most incredible stories of 2022. Uh, you guys mentioned Karenio Busta earlier as well. I think that's uh, like a very uh, one of my personal highlights of the year because this is this is just a guy who deserved that one, right? It, he played mm-hmm. Hurkacz in the final, but I remember uh, talking about it. I, I think I was also at a, at a Polish challenger that 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 event, so I, I barely barely got to see the final. But I remember talking to some you know Polish friends, and they were like, "Yeah, we have to go watch Hurkacz," and I was like, "Honestly, I want Karenio Busta to win." Uh, Hurkacz has already has a Masters thousand title. Yeah. He will probably get more, but Karenio Busta, like this, is a guy who is always not mentioned enough, and is always just forgotten by the you know by by the casual fans. So this was really I I feel like he needed something like that, and and that was that was a beautiful moment as well. Both of these both of these very unexpected titles. Jethro, um, unless you have something desperate to say, let's get to the first week of the US Open. Um, I will say one more thing on, just on. before we go to the US Open. Uh, yeah, sure. Dominic Team getting his first win in over well over a year. Uh, the team revival was uh, was very special. I think um, you know it made you know he made semifinals. You know it was all on clay, but um, yeah, that was pretty amazing as well. I remember watching him on clay at one or two points in in the year and and, uh, thinking, "Mm, not sure. Um, But it's a good segue because actually, uh, and I know we mentioned it before, Jethro, when you and I did an episode, uh, Let's Talk Dominic Team a few weeks ago, Mm -hmm. the belief went up for me after the match against Pablo Carreño Busta. Uh, We had a much deeper dive into that, uh, you and I, I know, a few weeks ago. So make sure you check out Let's Talk Dominic Team, an episode from about, about two months ago we did it. And I was really impressed. I thought it was a good match, but I was impressed with team's level. And I started to think, you know what? I think I could see some shoots of recovery here. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that, Jethro. Um, other other thoughts for me from the first week at the US Open? Rafa looking ropey. Um, really, and that would obviously come to fruition, if you like, in the second week. Uh, Sitsi pass, managing to get our eyes away from Serena Williams on in the first <laughs> round because... I mean, the whole world was watching Serena Williams, the whole world in their cat. Even that cat that, uh, that, that Medvedev mentioned at the beginning of the year in Australia, I think even that cat was watching uh, Serena Williams uh, in her first round match. But suddenly the cat ran over the keyboard and we suddenly saw um, on another channel uh, that Tsitsipas had lost the first set, six love. Damien, what happened? What's been happening to your friend Steph? <laughs> I honestly, I, I'm not sure I was watching Serena that day. The first round, I'm not. I don't know. I definitely watched. I know Kon- I watched. Uh, watched her against Kontaveit and Tomljanovic. I, I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, yeah, what happened on to Stefan Tsitsipas on that day? Uh, as I said earlier, I mean, the the U.S. Open has been very disappointing for him throughout the the, the years. Of course, he had that tragic loss to Chorich a couple of years back where he blew, blew mm. six match points. Yeah. Uh, what happened against Galan? That that's that's a good question because yeah, the first two sets he was just demolished. 
Uh, and of course, that was probably the best match Galan has ever played, especially as he is, well, first and foremost, a clay court specialist. I think he's probably way better on hard courts than his results have shown, but that's like a scheduling thing more. Uh, but but still, you know, that, that was that was just insane. Uh, Galan was serving and hitting his forehand incredibly well in that one. Yeah, this is, this is uh, was that the upset of the year in terms of Grand Slam play? I don't know. Is, is there anything that can really rival it? Um, mm. no, I'm not saying not. that Tsitsipas was a contender to win the whole, whole thing, but, no, you know, I know he's you always in that, in that second yeah. league, sort of. Yeah. And, and to see him lose to Galan, who yeah, barely has um, any results on, on hard courts up until that point, was was really pretty shocking. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. Any other memories? Fritz beating Sits to pass. I had Fritz oh, beating yeah. Sits to pass in the quarterfinals. Of yeah, yeah, game. me too. And they both lost on the same day. First and they round. both lost yeah. in the first round. Yeah, that, I think that yeah. was almost as surprising, um, particularly as oh, I yeah. think Sitz. You know, Fritz had a good end to the year, especially the ATP finals. Mm -hmm. um, any other memories from the first week, um, uh, Mario? Uh, yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah, Alcaraz wasn't looking as good. Probably, uh, he he reached this level um, quite as as the matches passed. Uh, even if I agree when when we were saying that uh, he was playing better uh, in spring, um, then. Um, I remember Rude. Rude play played uh, very well in the U.S. Open. Uh, not uh, not first week, but I remember then uh, he played uh, a great uh, uh, a great first part of the match against uh, Mute, uh, and then he play, he played uh, an unbelievable quarterfinal against Berrettini. Um, yeah, I remember that uh, Nadal lost a set to Ikata. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, I, I wasn't expecting a lot from Rafa, especially in the first matches, but it was still a good surprise. Um, even because I remember a horrible match between Rafa and Fognini um, in the second round. Um, yeah, it was it was quite horrible because I I I used to remember uh, the great battles between Nadal and Fonini yeah. in the past uh, yeah. because Fonini uh, did quite damage to Nadal in the past also on clay uh, and it was definitely um, a bad match. Uh, wow. Yeah, so I have to say probably at the beginning uh, on the men's side nothing very special. Uh, but in the end, he probably the best Grand Slam of the year, in my opinion. I I enjoyed a lot the U.S. Open, as as almost every year, I have to say. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I yeah. I I've enjoyed a lot this year's U.S. Open. Yeah. Um. Any other final memories of the first week? Anyone can say anything? Have we missed anything? Um. Shout out. Oh, go, yes, on. Chapel, go on, Jethro. Go on, Jethro. Yeah. Go on, Jethro. Oh yeah. Um. Shout out to Alcaraz Byers first round. Especially the second set. It's probably my favorite set of tennis of the whole year. Um, yeah. I was really happy because Byers had just been so poor on the hard courts leading up to that event and had these awful draws with Kyrgios, Korda, and like all these terrible first rounds. And then he just played amazingly against Alcaraz, and it was such high quality tennis. Um, so that was probably my highlight of the first week, I'd say. Okay. Um, yeah, but I'm a bit like you. My memories, um, a bit like you, Mario, my memories of the US Open are, are pretty strong and, and pretty good. But actually, I don't remember a lot about the first week on the men's side anyway. Listen, but things really did kick into gear, I would say, from the Monday, I think it was, of the second week. I'm pretty sure these matches all happened in the same day. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Nadal went out to TFO in what is the early afternoon match there. I'm pretty sure that the same day was the two five-setters involving Alcaraz and Chilich, I think, and Sinner against somebody in five Ivashka. sets. Ivashka. Um, neither of those two five-setters, though, uh, suggested what was to come. Uh, so Nadal obviously yeah. loses to TFO. Um, yeah, that was a kind of surprise, but maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, bearing in mind what we'd seen. TFO, by the way, played really well. One thing I would say about that match is Nadal just 
couldn't seem to get anything on TFO's serve. Seemed to be as though he was guessing at various points. Uh, and he obviously has latterly said that he, he was still carrying an injury going into the tournament. But listen, let's get into the match, I guess. Uh, by the way, anyone want to say anything about Ivashka against uh, Sinner or or Chilic against Alcaraz? Put your hand up and say something. Um what yeah, about the, about the first week, first of all, I wanted to add something about a match point uh, between Carreño Busta and Deminor. Um, yeah. Another hot shot by Carreño mm. Busta, I remember, hot point. Uh, yeah, then um, I remember Sinner was looking not so good, yeah, against Ivashka. Um, uh, and yeah, I agree with uh, with Vash, uh, pointing out Musetti Goffin uh <laughs> go fan match um yeah so i i wasn't expecting i i had i had um, more faith in sinner in wimbledon against uh, alcaraz than in the us open in us open i i was feeling like it was alcaraz's time uh to take the match um so probably that um that kind of battle um left me a little bit surprised uh i have to say but um, let's see the others what what the others have to say go on uh go on listen just just quickly i'll come to you next um uh damien i had a choice okay uh on the day of the quarterfinals shall we say i think i had a choice uh i could buy tickets for the women's semifinals for a very good value. I think both semifinals for about $100. Or I could watch the evening session uh, involving Alcaraz and Cinema, and there was probably another match as well in the quarterfinals. So that's the day before. So it's a Tuesday night or Wednesday day. I think that's the, or maybe Wednesday night, whatever. Put it like this. I went, you know what? I'm going for the women's semis. I I messed up, didn't I, Damien? Should I should I have known? Should I have known that this was going to be a classic? Perhaps. I mean, the the, the most recent matches before that, uh, I think, kind of showed that it doesn't have to be as straightforward as maybe some thought it would be. I think at Wimbledon, it was mostly uh, you know it was pretty tough to predict their match because well, yeah, both guys had some question marks when it comes to grass. I think after the, the, the performance that Alcaraz had against Ota, everyone sort of jumps to, okay, so Carlos is winning that. And of course, Sinner had no main draw grass court wins uh, coming into Wimbledon. Then in Umag, I think, again, Carlos was the, the big favorite coming into the final. And that was, I know, that played out completely <laughs> differently. So uh, that's uh, that's perhaps how, uh, you know, why coming into the quarterfinals, I figured that it doesn't have to be easy. Especially as, as as we said, both guys weren't exactly at their best. Sinner had played five sets with Ivashka. Sinner had played with five sets with uh, Altmaier in the opening round, I think. And and Alcaraz, even though he only had that five setter against Cilic, also wasn't looking that strong. And then suddenly they both raised their level so much, uh, you know, compared to what they showed earlier in the event. And I think even compared to what Alcaraz played in the semis and in the final, where yeah, you know, in the final, if he didn't save these match uh, set points in the third set, I'm not sure he would have even won that. Right? Uh, he was the one. He was the player who was looking more tired physically at that point. Of course, he had played three consecutive five setters, which which was probably the reason. Uh, so yeah, to see them play that f insane, uh, you know, um, insanely long match. Uh, as Vance is, is saying on the chat right now, that that you know the the, the pretty much uh, the, the level was pretty spectacular all the time. There weren't like many many lulls. Uh, there was a lot of drama as well with Carlos not really you know not, not being able to take these tie breaks. Uh, I would say it it only really can be rivaled by uh, Alcaraz Djokovic in Madrid in terms of like the match of the year. As much as I like Alcaraz Kitsmanovic and I like pointing it out in every single discussion, I, I don't think it really can be mentioned on the same, you know, level as these two matches. And of course, yeah, yeah. And Vance is also mentioning that Rublev Chapo match yeah, that, I, that, that I sort of yeah. hint, hinted at. Yeah, that was Shapovalov after that terrible summer. Um, just yeah. yeah, randomly he 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 starts finally grabbing some form. He had at, at Cincy he lost a pretty decent match to to Medvedev I think seven, five seven five seven, 
so there was some signs that you know he's getting better and Rublev probably played one of his best matches of the season as well and even uh you know he even uh confirmed that with the uh the easy win that he got over Nori in the in the forefront but yeah Alcaraz Sinner one of the matches of the year for sure and uh, for many, I, I remember reading that you know it's gonna be like uh, the start of a very beautiful rivalry. I still think that if they play like I don't know, 15 times, Carlos is probably gonna get more wins than Yannick, but we'll see. Like like significantly more wins than Yannick, but we shall see. And and yeah, after these five hours, you can certainly have doubts about what I just said. <laughs> so um, Carlos was a breakdown in the fifth set, was he? Yeah, yeah, two three. Two three and Sinner was serving. I if I remember well, probably. Yeah, but I remember that I remember that uh, he was a breakdown in the fifth. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Because I was I was following very <laughs> with passion that match, so I remember perfectly. But uh, I also remember very well. Um, Rublev ended uh, his quarterfinal in tears against Tiago. Yes, yes, I was there. I was there for that match. Um, mm. And then I also remember uh, Rude playing unbelievably good against Berrettini in the first and the second set. Mm. Uh, a fantastic performance, even if Berrettini wasn't really there, probably. Yeah, um, yeah quite sad to see to see Rublev ending in tears, but also Tiafo ending in tears uh, after the semifinals uh, against. Um, uh, against Alcaraz, uh, which was also quite a good match. Tell us a bit about um, TFO, uh, Jethro. I mean, his run, obviously, Rafa probably being the highlight. I remember him saying it in his on-court interview afterwards that his legs were like jelly as he was trying to surf for the match. Oh, no, he didn't have to surf for it. I think he broke again. So he was like, I'm really grateful because I'm not sure my legs could have taken serving for the match. And I think he, he broke Rafa at 3-5. Uh, he was already a breakup, so he managed to win that 6-3. Such a huge character. I was with the rest of the stadium for the for the match against Rublev. I was kind of on his side. Um, but he couldn't quite get it over the line, obviously, against Alcaraz in the semi. Yeah, uh, his run was just so, so exciting, so fun, so inspiring. Um, and the fact that happened in New York as well was so good because... You know, there haven't been a whole, like the US haven't really been great as a whole in promoting, you know, these new tennis players. Um, maybe that Netflix documentary will change it because I'm sure it's got a big American focus, but um, it was brilliant. Um, so, like, what was really quite, I found quite fascinating about TFO's serving was that although he really didn't get broken very often, remember before the semi final with Alcaraz, He'd been broken five times in all of his matches other than against Diego. And Diego broke him five times, six times by himself. But he was still holding serve a lot. But he was just doing so well on his second serve. Like his second serve just, I don't know why, he kept on missing first serves. And it's been quite a constant theme for him. But um, yeah, just like the showmanship, like just everything. It was it was amazing. And um, fully deserved to beat Rafa. Uh just never really looked like Rafa pr properly got going in New York um, and thought TFO just played brilliantly and fully deserved to win that. And um, yeah, I was surprised Alcaraz managed to let that go to a fifth set. I thought he was going to win it in four, but um, yeah, he just, there's just something special about TFO. And when he's got that, you know, roaring US crowd behind him, it's, it's just really, really fun to watch. And he also had Michelle Obama behind him as well in that semi-final. I remember mm. them having a nice uh, few images afterwards. Meanwhile, on, over on the other side of the draw, I know Mario has touched on Casper Ruud beating Berrettini. Uh, I, I was more shocked by that than than most other results, I would suggest. I don't know. I thought Berrettini would put up a better fight than that. But listen, there's other matches going on as well. I mean, we had Nick Kyrgios, I think, in the fourth round uh, beating Medvedev, but then going out to, to Hatchinov. I think both of those two results were a bit deceptive in some ways. And then Hatchinoff comes up against Kasper Ruud. At no point, I was in the stadium for that match. At no, There was a rally, I think about a 50-shot rally during the tiebreak. It may have been on set point. And that, mm -hmm. that rally summed up my feelings about the match. At no point during that rally did I think Kasper Ruud is breaking down. Kasper Ruud is not winning this point. And at no point did I think, even though Hatchinoff, I think, won the third set, 
Um, at no point did I think Kasparov was not winning that match or Hatchinov was losing it. Although hats off to, to Hatchinov obviously getting as far as the semi-final. I think that's his first slam semi-final, maybe his only slam, slam semi-final. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. He was yeah. he was a set away from doing it at Wimbledon last year, but he's, okay. he's two sets to one on Shapovalov. But um, no. yeah, so that was the closest he'd been before. Anyway, sets up a final. Kaspar Ruud, Alcaraz. I thought your take on it, um, I think it was Damien was touching on it. I thought that was quite interesting and that you thought that Alcaraz was finally running out of steam. I remember he did a lot of serving and volleying that day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, near the end of the third set, yeah, there there was uh, a couple of set points. I I don't think he did it on a set point, but there was definitely some, you know, intent to, uh, there was definitely some intent to shorten the points uh, and it felt like he needed it, yeah. I, I believe if, if Rude won that set, if Rude won that tie break, then maybe he was actually going to become the uh the, the, the first <laughs> maiden Grand Slam champion this year. And the only, of course, because it was the last slam. Uh but yeah, I, I probably you know in, in history, uh which is sort of what we mentioned when it comes to the Australian Open, this is not the way it will it will go down in history, right? When we look at it, you know, ten years from now. We're just going to remember Alcaraz, Alcaraz won his maiden slam. We're going to remember the match against Sinner, you know, maybe the fact that he had a lot of five setters. But no one is going to remember that there was a moment where it really seemed like Rude was you know, as, uh, a, a step ahead of Carlos. Yeah, um, and I think that's the point. But I think really Rude had a horrible five minutes, ten minutes. Uh, basically, uh, that tiebreak, I think, and now again, I'm going to probably get this one. I think it may have been 7-1, 7-0. 7-1, yeah. 7-1. Like uh, a horrible tiebreak. I remember a couple of shanks, maybe in the last game or in, in that tiebreak. And then I think it gets broken quite early in the fourth set, maybe again in the first game. I, I don't remember. My, my feeling at the end of the match was I remember uh, analysing it. I was just thinking it was all about that five or ten minutes for Rude, mm. where unusually he sort of had a... Uh, you know, had a, had a moment where he just wasn't playing very well. And that was enough for, for Alcaraz to win his first uh, major title. Any more thoughts on the US Open? Anyone? Put your hands up. Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, let's move on. So, well done, Carlos Alcaraz. I'm sure we'll be talking about you a lot more in the future, especially when it comes to slam wins. Um, okay, okay, here's a, here's a quick one. Uh, over or under, Carlos Alcaraz, 10 grand slams. Jethro, over or under? Oh, gosh. Um, Mario, over or under while Jethro thinks about it? Over. Damien? I was hoping you were going to say five, and then it would mm. have been an easy over. I can't believe, uh, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm going to say under. Uh, Barely under. Okay, I'm going to say over, but that's just, oh, it's tough. But yeah, okay, I'm going to say yeah, I'll go with over. Yeah. I think I'm going over too, but... But yeah, five would have been too easy, Damien. Uh, yeah. We don't make things easy for you here on Top of Tennis. Okay, listen, moving on. Hardcourt swing, the last sort of spell of the indoor hardcourt swing uh, in Europe uh, primarily. Um, any thoughts on that? Djokovic, unbelievable, uh, coming back to the court. Tel Aviv, Astana winning back to back. Uh, some more highlights, of course, from Dominic Team. Uh, Medvedev looking like there's some shoots of recovery before he ends up shooting himself in the foot again. Um, and anything else, Tsitsipas pushing Djokovic in, in a match that could could be held up in there in the best matches of the year against Djokovic, although I think Djokovic-Runa in the final was maybe as good and was certainly exciting. Uh, Runa, of course, maybe second only to Djokovic in terms of narrative at this point of the year. Alcaraz, of course, getting injured and, and sort of disappearing from, from the scene for a little while, at least until January. Um, probably there's one or two other narratives I'm missing. Jethro, what are your thoughts on this period of the season? Yeah, did, did you mention Felix? I don't, you might have Oh, done of course, that. Felix, unbelievable yeah. run. Didn't get broken serve for about 27 years. Yeah, it was a long, it was, it was like 90 odd games or something. Yeah, like. it was 89, yeah. Um, yeah. And he, yeah, I thought he played really well. I had him as kind of a second or third favourite heading into the end of the finals. Yeah, I think I had him um, second. Yeah, I thought he was fantastic. Um, and really good, you know, after winning that first title at the start of the year, finally. And, just, you know, his his finals record is already just looking... It was like 0-8, I think. And now he's 
Yeah, 93 straight. Four and nine, months. stuff like that. Four, four and nine. nine, it's already looking a lot better. Um, I'm sure, obviously, he will lose more in the future. But um, So he won four out of five yeah. this year. What, what was the one he lost? Was it Rublev? Yeah, he no. lost to he lost to Rublev. Uh, what was it? Uh, Marseille, right? Mm. Marseille, yeah, the one that we talked yeah. about earlier. Okay. Um, yeah. But good, good. Considering losing eight in a row and then winning four out of five at the big turnaround. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but of course, as I said, Djokovic was largely getting all the headlines. Listen, let's get to Paris Bercy. Uh, there was lots of other things going on, but but Paris Bercy, I think, was a great tournament. I went there for the middle Wednesday, as it turned out. Although the middle Wednesday is still the first round or first match for certain players, such as Rafa Nadal. I saw him lose. There was all this concern about Nadal and his career. I think it's still a bit premature. Let's see how the first few weeks of 2022 go. Tommy Paul playing excellently that day. Um, and what else, Paris Bercy? Well, Jill Simon retiring. Anyone want to have a quick word on Jill Simon? Well, Go on, Mario. I have to say, mm, fantastic career, fantastic, uh, fantastic person. Also, uh, so clever on court, uh, and he he demonstrated also in the last tournament of his career because he he went through some great battles. Uh, overcoming uh, Murray, I wasn't expecting this. Uh, also, Fritz, yeah. uh, above all. <laughs> uh, but I remember very well Andy Murray because he was up in the score, uh, Murray. Um, mm -hmm. And so I I was like, okay, uh, it's the end. And, and then um, Simon found somewhat, um, in some way, the strength to, to stay in the tournament, then to beat Taylor Fritz, who was... Uh, surprisingly uh, unsure against Simon, uh, but that's the way Simon makes you feel on the court, probably. Um, even if he, he, it was a lot disappointing from Fritz, yeah. Uh, but still a good tournament for his for the end of his career, making the third round in the Master in Paris. So um, a deserved end to to a great career, I have to say. So I I. I was kind of happy that he it has not ended up with a with an easy uh, first round defeat, uh, mm -hmm. and he was uh, he was quite happy in the end because he he made a lot of um, he made a, a lot of good good job in in Paris like, um, in front of his own crowd. So good a good end of career. Yeah, he wasn't yeah, always very like entertaining on the court. You know, he kind of played chess instead of tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, not that no, I like chess, but you know, on the tennis court, it's not always great to watch. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I always admired you know the the intelligence not only on the court but also you know he he was just a very smart guy and uh, and it showed in his tennis and uh, Listen, of let's... course uh, max maximize his potential. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Going to the semi-finals, um, Jethro, did you watch Tsitsipas, um, Djokovic? I did. It was excellent. So like, it was so good. Um, there were a couple of performances from Tsitsipas this year where he just really kind of stood like stood up against. You hear this, John? You hear this? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not a Tsitsipas fan. I'm just, you know, I'm giving him his credit where it's due. Um, That's this match doing, was really yeah. good from Tsitsipas. You know, he. I still thought, I mean, he, he really wasn't far away from winning it, but um, I still think, you know, he showed that this matchup isn't, I mean, it's probably still going to be very dominated for the rest of their careers, but, you know, he showed some fight and he played some really great tennis and took the game to Djokovic and that was very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I've yet to play Sitsipas uh, tennis, so maybe maybe I should play chess, play chess against him, Damien, and we'll pack out Paris Berthi. <laughs> 10,000 people. Listen, anyway, the final uh, for me was, and, and and it's difficult to remember because I was commentating on it. I mean, I remember it, but what I mean is in terms of maybe the quality wasn't quite on the same level as some other matches this year, but for me, it was, was dramatic. The final game was insane. I think Djokovic had five or six break points. Um, Runa had his first uh, match point and he double faulted. Um, yeah, and it really, of course, Djokovic wins the first set, and you think, okay, here we go. I think Djokovic had never failed to won a, win a Masters 1000 final, having won the first set. But Runa, uh, his serving was insane. Uh, Mario, what are your thoughts on that final? Um, I think that 
probably after that first set, um, Djokovic looked like a bit tired mentally. Um, I I also f- felt a bit weird that he he hasn't been able to take any of his chances, uh, which were a lot during that match. Um, it was a but, break up yeah. in the third. It was a break up in the third. But a, a lot of credit also to to Orbel Rune because at his age, after having already beaten four straight top ten. Um, being there in the final, losing the first set, finding the strength to um, to stay there mentally and to um, I don't know to to save all the, all those break points, all those chances to to a legend like Djokovic, and then in the end winning winning this title. Um, yeah, it's been it's been amazing for for Rune and. Yeah, probably Djokovic less gritty and less evil than than usual uh, that day. I don't know. Uh, I I feel like he fought till the end, but um, I don't know. It wasn't uh, as mad as losing like uh, uh, other times. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, any final thoughts on Paris Bercy, or we can just go straight to the ATP Tour Finals? Yeah, just a like really, a, really, yeah, yeah just on, yeah. a really quick one. Go ahead, one. Go um, ahead. I'll be second. Yeah, we, so we, um, we mentioned Simon retiring and he got to do it in Paris and he won these matches on his own crowd. I just thought it was really, really sad how Andrea Seppi had to go out. Um, and obviously, Mario, you probably have, you know, your thoughts on this as well. Um, I've been a huge fan of his since I can, since I was, you know, since I was a young tennis fan. And the fact that, you know, the Italian Tennis Federation didn't give him a wild card to, Naples or um, Florence it was a real shame, and he didn't get. You know, he kind of just faded away in some challenges and didn't get a proper goodbye. And you know, he's the only player to ever beat Federer in the first week of the Australian Open. He's done a lot of great things for tennis, and I just thought it was really sad how his year ended. Personally, Set, uh, Mario, give me thirty seconds on that. Well, I'm not in love with the Italian Federation, I have to say, um, and not only for this fact. Uh, but uh, we we must not for, forget that Andrea Seppi, uh, just like Fognini, um, has been um, our uh, as an Italian our uh, our only hope uh, for years and years. Um, and, and yeah, he he brought us to to a Davis Cup semi final. Uh, in a period which was very difficult to be in a in a sem- in the semi final of the Davis Cup, um, yeah, uh, I was, yeah, it, it's been pretty bad, pretty bad. Uh, I pointed out also, uh, <laughs> also on Twitter, I made the the image that that went um, had a lot of engagement because yeah, I think that uh, everyone agrees that not good. A good looking for for our federation. One thing that Naples did bring us though was an uh, some sort of cutout uh, on the day of the final, and we missed the first two or three games, and we just got to see the the the, the Nepalese sort of sea uh, or the Mediterranean Sea uh, <laughs> images of that. Within the corner was the score, I think, uh, between Berrettini and Musetti was in the final. Certainly Musetti against mm-hmm. somebody. Um, anyway, yeah. uh, one of the uh, more peculiar images. Of the uh, listen, did you want to say something, Damien? Yeah, yeah, sure, I can. Uh, there's uh, there was a comment about the the fight, the, the game of the year between Djokovic and oh, Luna, yeah. and I was just gonna say that I totally agree. Uh, so many players have folded in these sort of situations against Djokovic or either of the big three in the past, and that's uh, yeah, the fact that Holger, you know, even though I agree with Mario that Djokovic was not at, at 100, percent the fact that Holger survived this pressure and. I think Rune was also precisely like the reason why I said under when it came to Alcaraz 10 okay. slams. Because I, it, it, it kind of looks at the moment like it will be at least competitive. But, I, I, you know, looking at it right now, I'm not sure if I if my answer was right because, you know, there's so many years in Alcaraz's career. And yeah, when it comes to Seppi, there's so much, you know, the, the, there are so many young Italians right now that I honestly think, this is an unpopular opinion, I think, uh, that uh, both Florence and Naples, that would have been a stretch. Like, there's just so many Italians that you kind of have to give them 
opportunities. But you know, I, of course, I would have still given him, given him one of these. Uh, you know, he was going to finish in Ortisei anyway, but that doesn't mean that he shouldn't play like one top quality uh, Italian event. He played uh, one of them, uh, but only qualifying and lost uh, Florence, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, ATP Tour finals. Uh, the final sort of the 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 the. the... ATP Tour singles, at least, uh, moment of the year, final moment of the year, if you like. Um, going into that, I could only see really Djokovic winning it. I mean, it's probably quite easy to say that after the event. I still thought Felix would have a better tournament. I saw him at least coming through the group. Um, Rafa, I had no idea he could have got anywhere between losing all three group matches uh, and getting to the final. I probably didn't quite have him winning it, but uh, somewhere in between, and that's kind of where he felt winning one of his two group matches. Um, Medvedev losing all three in tie breaks. Anyone want to say something on that? Hmm. A perfect hmm. summary of his season. <laughs> a horrible yeah. season. He was recently asked, actually, uh, I think uh, about a week ago, he was asked to, to name his highlights from this year, and he just went silent, and he said nothing. Um, and he sort of then started laughing, saying, well, there's not much to say, really. And he couldn't, he didn't, he, I think he was probably too embarrassed to mention the uh, Los Cabos and, and this kind of thing. Um, anything else? Sitsi Pass going out. Rublev, Sitsi Pass, Tools, comment. Anyone want to say something on that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was, I've seen a lot of kind of like, you know, different opinions on this and they're like oh he's absolutely right was he right to say it probably not i thought i mean i thought it was a bit harsh and a bit unfair um but is it something that we've heard a lot of you know analysts and people in the tennis media say quite a lot yes so i mean he did have a point i do think Rublev's is developing a lot more into his game and i respect him a lot for that um and i thought saying that after he's lost to him you know it's a bit childish and it's like, well, you couldn't beat him. So why are you kind of calling his game out? You know, it's a very catty kind of, you know, junior level kind of thing to say, I think. I, I thought it was a little bit funny as well, in a way. I mean, listen, if you're mm -hmm. Rublev, you've won the match, so you probably don't care that much. City pass went a bit weird though. A couple of weeks later when he sort mm. of had a sort of, um, yeah. a, a, a sort of weird apology where he said he was trying to motivate um, uh, yeah, exactly, Mario. We all know what that means. Where he said he was trying to motivate Rublev for his semi final. Um, what City Pass thinks he's some sort of you know coach as well now or something. Well, anyway, <laughs> listen, we'll move on from that and we'll get to Djokovic. Rude obviously getting to the final that to me was a bit of a surprise too. But I think maybe the final word needs to be on Novak Djokovic and his performances in Turin. Jethro, um, yeah, any word on Djokovic and, and how he did in this part of the year? Yeah, just look, look like the best player in the world is as simple as I can put it. Um, there's a lot of mess with, you know, COVID vaccines and frozen ranking points and banning Russians, which has contributed to a complete mess in the rankings. Uh, yeah, I think Alcaraz deserved the year end number one for what he did, definitely. Yeah. But I think Novak Djokovic is the best tennis player in the world right now. And I don't think there's a lot of doubt about it. I, I, I agree. I also thought that Rafa was the best player in the world for the first sort of five months of the year. And it was weird that he was languishing mm -hmm. in fifth going into the French Open. It was just just odd. Um, yeah. Damien, any thoughts on Djokovic in, in the last few weeks? Well, I mean, Nadal was fifth because he didn't play in 2021, right? After whatever. So, you know, that that's kind of understandable. We have a 52 weeks ranking system. Djokovic mm -hmm. in the last few weeks, yeah, definitely proved that when, when he's healthy, when he's, or, or even not fully healthy because he had all these issues, right? Breathing, uh, trouble breathing. It, there, there, it, during the ATP finals, there were a lot of moments when we were thinking, you know, if, if Djokovic is going to have enough left in the tank to even win this event. Uh, but whenever, basically whenever he needed, he raised his level. That's the ability of a champion, of course. Uh, that's something that Djokovic, Nadal, Federer as well have, have perfected over the years. That you know, whenever they're not playing their best, even at the, in the in the most important moments against guys like Fritz in the semis, against Rude in the final, they can still raise their game. And it, yeah, I, I would agree that it never really went. It never really felt like it was in doubt. Although you know, he he didn't give himself like he made his road tougher by struggling against Medvedev in the in the final final uh, you know rubber of the group stage because did he really need that of course it's it's pretty hard to ask players to to like tank um that that's uh, you know 
sportsmen in general are very competitive, of course, and they don't want to lose. But there, there was a bit of a like question, you know, did, did you really need that? Isn't that gonna, you know, somehow um, be an obstacle when it comes to the semis and the final? And I think it kind of was, but he was still able to overcome that. So, you know, uh, once again, when it comes to like history, how we're gonna look at it in ten years? Djokovic just dominated the, the ATP finals, the, the best field there is. Djokovic beat five top ten top ten players after Rune beat five top ten players in Paris. Indeed. I, I think what I what I meant with the, the Nadal comment, though, in particular, in terms of the first six months is completely right. He was injured for the back end of last season, but he'd gone from number six in the world at the end of the year to number five in the world. Uh, and he'd won the first two majors and he'd also won Acapulco and got to the final of Indian Wells. So it still didn't quite seem to, to mm -hmm. add up. But who knows? Anyway, listen, um, I, I completely echo those sentiments on Djokovic. Um, one final question for all three of you, and we're going to close this um, epic uh show i thought it would be up to two hours it's gone beyond two hours um but the epic sh epic question at the end of the epic show or the the short quick fire question and i just want one word i'll let jethro think about it while i give it to mario then damien and then jethro uh who has had the best atp year on the men's side between alcaraz nadal Djokovic? just give me a word mario Djokovic. Damien? Uh, Alcaraz. Jethro? I, I was going to say Alcaraz as well. Yeah. And I'll go Rafa, I think. Uh, <laughs> two majors, uh, etc. Um, <laughs> I just think if it, I wouldn't swap uh, Djokovic's year if I was Rafa, and I'm, uh, I'm not sure um, how... Uh, Novak would feel about that. But anyway, uh, listen, guys, anything else to add before I bring this this epic uh, show to an end? Think That's cool. good. For the first time, we are all silent. Guys, <laughs> uh, it's been two hours and 25 minutes. Uh, I have no idea whether I'll turn this into a podcast or not. If I do, I'll have to turn it into about three episodes. But it's out there on the YouTube uh, thing and various other platforms. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. By the way, get in the comments section below. Let us know what you think on our thoughts uh, at any point throughout this show and, and uh, hit that like button too. Uh, but for the rest of you, uh, including the three guests that I have on today, Damien, Jethro and Mario, thank you for stopping by. And anybody else who did tune in over the last two and a half hours or so. Also, thank you for stopping by. And I'll leave you this, with this very, very short message. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.